Also, if you want to read an advanced chapter or want to support the author of this novel, then you can support the author. Link in description. This novel was possible because of a Patreon member request. So if you want to support this channel you can consider becoming a Patreon member to make the request like this. Or you can support this channel on PayPal or Ko-fi link in the description. And if you want to buy Google Drive link which has more than 300 plus novel audiobook then you can visit my Ko-fi account. Where you will get Google Drive link in just $20 for lifetime. Chapter 1, Chapter 1, I never got one. Ugh, why him? I grumbled as I saw the last three episodes of Modern Family, the last season. Even at the end, Alex and Haley's character development seem stunted, and Alex seemingly ends up with Alvin. Manny became insufferable, and Luke, well, Luke is Luke. The awkward, manipulative professor that used to be Haley's boyfriend. It's like the writers conveniently forget about that and set them up anyway. She did have a major crush on the guy when she was at college, but he chose Haley. Maybe it's a curse of the middle child kind of thing where they always received used things from their older siblings. I sighed and felt terrible for the kid. Even Dylan was barely okay in the last season. Phil said before the 20s is the time for them to make mistakes and get to know themselves. But surely a lovely and intelligent girl like Alex or a smart girl like Haley could end up with someone better. Welp. No time to complain. Time to start from the beginning again. I have been binge watching it every single day and have finished the run more than seven times now. Maybe it became a comfort show for me because of the family love setting in the show, the one I never had. Ring ring. The MacGyver bell in my house rang loudly, snapping me out of my stupor. The simple setup was created by myself, and I fixed the bell on my walls before I connected it to the lower floor. I put my phone back in my pocket as I used my phone to watch shows instead of the plasma TV in my living room. That one was used for games and stuff. I grabbed my coat before I exited my apartment. I went downstairs and unlocked the door to the apartment directly beneath mine. Good morning, Bella. How's your sleep? I asked. The house owner was an old lady in a wheelchair who could only breathe using an oxygen tube up her nose. She only smiled in reply and looked at me with a helpless expression. The landlord of the three-story apartment needed some care in her twilight years, so I get to live here cheap as long as I help her with some stuff. After taking care of her needs, we went to make breakfast together. Non non. The Italian grandmother scolded me as I wanted to put some herbs in her sauce. Taste. First. I stopped stirring the sauce in the pot. The smell of the sauce that I was making made my stomach gurgle, and I wanted to have breakfast soon. Ciao Bella. You're killing me. I used some Italian wordplay that put a smile on her face. I put a spoonful of the sauce on a spoon and blow it gently before I give her a taste. She nodded in satisfaction after she got what she wanted. Good job. You, Mary now. I helplessly showed a wry smile after she said that. Maybe in the future. Granny said with some concern, you've been alone. Long time. I grabbed her hand gently, I have you, did I not? Bella removed my hand and pinched my cheeks, non non. Don't be alone. I'm gone soon. The immigrant grandmother couldn't speak a complete sentence after her stroke a few weeks ago. I have been working from home to check up on her since her family is far away. Don't say that, Noni. Grandma, you're going to live till 150. Believe me. Bella looked at me sadly. Only one person in the world knew me, and that was the grandmother in front of me. I forgot the garlic bread. I will stop by the grocery store later. I said, changing the topic. We had a fun breakfast together before I ran upstairs to do my job as a programmer. Luckily, my status as a senior developer allowed me to work from home as long as I reached my daily target requirement. I remembered what Noni said while I was typing. I never got a girlfriend, nor did I try to find one. I only got one night stands with various girls, basking myself in the meaningless pleasures of the flesh. Even that was for only a short while before I stopped. My twenties were spent with me struggling to survive in this ruthless world as an orphan. Deep down, I don't think I can love someone as I have never received any love. I should talk about that in therapy, but who got the time? After three hours of work to finish the entire requirement of what was supposed to be a ten-hour job, I grabbed my bike key and my helmet. Noni. Garlic bread and tomato puree. Anything else? Buy some wine and meat, Noni asked. Then, she hesitatingly asked, can you check the post? My son. He will wire some checks at the end of the month. I widened my eyes at Noni, you can eat meat now? When did your teeth grow back? Noni threw her slippers on my head before I ran away to my scooter parked in front of my house. I never went to the post office to check what she requested. I knew her son had abandoned her a few years back, but she kept hoping to hear from him. The check was only an excuse for her to ask about her son. I picked up some oranges and groceries at the grocery store. On my way back, a sudden gust of wind suddenly makes me almost fall from my bike. What the hell is that? I opened my helmet visor and looked at the sky. It was as clear as ever. I scanned the surroundings, and I saw everyone looking at me like I was a clumsy man. So, freaking weird, I muttered and restarted my bike engine before I drove home. And that was it. That is the end of my life in this world. Asterisk truck horn blaring. Asterisk. The last thing I remember was that a speeding truck with its lights on crashed into my bike. I had an accident on my way home, and after a period of struggle to keep my consciousness intact, my world darkened. So, why the hell did I wake up in a white space? Is it platform 934th?
I scanned my surroundings, which looked like a clean train station, before walking toward the train boarding line. There were several people there, all waiting to board the next train to what I assumed was the afterlife. How long have I waited? The time here was a bit messed up. Suddenly, the train conductor arrived in his blue uniform and a cap to check everyone's tickets. Wait. Tickets. I hurriedly checked my pockets to find out that I was carrying nothing. The conductor moves down the line quickly as he checks everyone's tickets one by one, but I'm becoming more and more anxious as I keep searching for the non-existent ticket. Tickets, please. The Grim Reaper finally arrives at my spot to ask me. Um, I seem to have lost my ticket. He said sternly, no ticket, no boarding. I know, but I never got a ticket. I almost teared up. No ticket, no boarding. He said and pulled me out of the line. The security guard came to apprehend me. Wait, just tell me how I can get a ticket. I screamed and tried to break free of the security guards holding me by both arms. The security guard dragged me outside the train station and threw me on the floor. Ouch. I yelled out in pain as my butt hit the cold hard floor. Go get tickets. Then, you can board the train. I looked around on the empty white street with no one about it. How? I muttered. Wandering in the infinite space, I tried hard to find ways to get a ticket for myself. I'd been walking for days, maybe years, or just a few minutes. My mind was groggy, as if I'd fallen into the abyss. I keep walking to find the ticket booth, someone else, or anything else. Suddenly, I remembered Noni, who is going to take care of her now. My mind was so preoccupied with the train ticket that I forgot about the people I'd left behind. Noni, I'm sorry. I started to sob as I walked aimlessly. Maybe she is still waiting for me to come back with the garlic bread. However, I am now stuck here with nowhere to go. I keep walking and crying until I lose track of time and who I am. I keep reliving my worst fear of Noni dying in that house alone. Unknown to me, someone tried to grab my shoulder from behind. But as I keep walking forward, the guy behind me keeps missing his mark. He wanted to call me, but the voice didn't travel in the white space unless you were face to face with someone. The same situation repeated a few times for a few hundred years, or maybe a few hours. As I sobbed while walking, suddenly, the same sudden gust of wind that appeared before my death appeared again, causing me to be pushed backward. What the fuke dash I almost cursed the wind. It was the main reason for my death before, and because of it, I had to abandon Noni. But I didn't realize it came to me as a helper this time. Suddenly, my shoulder was grabbed by a hand bigger than mine. I turned back to see a man in a blue uniform huffing his breath heavily as he stopped me. Finally, I reached you. Ha ha ha. I didn't reply to him as my mind still felt groggy and in a haze. He dragged me back to the train station, and we entered his small office by the side of the boarding area. Countless files and papers were stacked neatly on the officer's desk. Nettie my boy, it's been hard, for me to reach you, the officer said and sat down on the table. I was invited to sit right in front of him, and he took out a file with my name on it from the stack of files. Edward Franzetti, born 1990, son of James Franzetti and Martha Knitting. He served me tea which I graciously accepted. After drinking it, I can feel my mind getting cleared up. Sorry about throwing you outside. That is only for criminals and people without a ticket. But in your case, it's a bit special. How? I asked. Your ticket isn't here as it hasn't been issued yet. The officer said with a solemn look on his face. He lights up a cigarette and takes a deep puff. I haven't seen a case like this in ages. There are a lot of them in the Japanese branch but not here. I don't care about the ticket anymore. What happened to Bella? My Minoni? I asked anxiously. The officer released his cigarette smoke and started to take out another file. Usually, I won't bother to answer if anyone else asks this, but I will let you know about her for a favor between us. Deal. What kind of favor? I asked, eyeing the file in his hand. I'll tell you about her. You don't tell anyone about you being kicked out of the train station. Deal, I replied instantly. The officer smiled and opened the file for Granny. Hmm, this is curious. The officer said. He smiled and flashed a look of reminiscence as he read the file. He even changed the way he looked at me. His stern face melted into the genial expression of a village elder. What? I asked. It said here your granny died peacefully in her sleep one minute before you died. What? I slammed the table and stood up. Calm down. Let's see here. With her karma points, she had gotten a first class ticket to the afterlife long before you came here. I calmed down a bit, I see. So, she passed. She, didn't suffer, right? I asked. No. The officer replied curtly and closed Granny's file. Telling me about her situation in the mortal world was already career-ending for him, not to mention telling me about Granny's situation in the afterlife. Now, to deal with you, the officer said. Unfortunately, as your time hasn't come yet, we couldn't tally your karma points here and have to send you back to the mortal world. He had a scheming look on his face, but I ignored it as my mind was focused on another matter. So, I'll live. I asked, a bit dissatisfied. You know, usually when people are told they can go back, they get excited. But not you, huh? The officer said sarcastically. Let's see. Yup. Truck again. What did the Japanese people do exactly that the truck culture spread even to another afterlife branch? The officer took out a pen and started to scribble at my files. I'll remove being crushed by the 14-ton truck and become a roadkill, to swerve your bike and avoid the truck. You will live without remembering what happened here. 
You also won't feel discombobulated as the afterlife energy will help you settle down in the mortal world for a short grace period. Do I have a choice? I asked. None. The officer replied sternly. Let's go to your station. The officer said and brought me to the train boarding line. Instead of a white train, a red train was waiting for me there. This looks ominous, I said, and as I looked around, I discovered I was the only one there. We didn't usually send people back, so I pulled this train from another line to get you home. The officer said. I boarded the train and sat by the window. The officer stood nearby to talk to me. As you've stepped foot in both the afterlife and the purgatory, you may find something extra in your life when you get back. The officer said with a smirk. You're giving me a system. I asked teasingly. What's a system? The officer asked, intrigued. Nothing. By the way, I never caught your name. Me? I'm. The train horn bellowed, so I couldn't hear the middle part, but I heard the last part, the Grim Reaper. Omniscient POV. The train started to move and disappeared from the station. The Grim Reaper took his last puff of cigarette before he turned back. An armored angel was standing there as he turned. Why did you do it? The female angel asked. Do what? The officer asked innocently. You sent him to another world. The female officer grabbed the man's coat and lifted him up. The male officer took a deep puff and said, it was too late for him. He'd spent time in purgatory for almost 10 years. He can't go back, so I send him somewhere else. You violated the afterlife code? Do you know what will happen to you? The officer gently removed the female officer's hand. I know. Not only did you send him to another world, but you also made him reborn there. He won't receive his memory till his body is ready is not an excuse for your action. For my son, I will gladly spend 1000 years in purgatory as long as he can get the life he always wanted. The life, that I failed to give him. The male officer said as he fixed his collars. The female officer sighed in defeat and escorted the Grim Reaper to receive his punishment. I already had enough trouble when a first class soul accidentally transmigrated as the wind. Now, this. I am sure I will get demoted after this. She murmured whisperingly. She sighed in defeat before she realized something. She glared at the grim male reaper, do you have anything to do with that too? With Mrs. Bella reincarnating as the wind, the grim male reaper smirked and replied ambiguously, who knows? Edward POV. Ugh, my head. I muttered as I found myself lying in the streets. However, I found the roads to be unfamiliar from the streets I had my accident before. Hey, kid, watch where you are going. An old man yelled at me from his car. Suddenly, my head throbbed in pain, and I struggled to collect myself. I staggered a few times, and my sight became dim. It took me a minute to get used to the feelings. What the fuck? I cursed out loud. The old man was startled, shook his head, and drove off as he noticed I was okay. I'm 14, I am in. California? Seriously. I mumbled. Nah, nah, that can't be it. I looked around and found a convex mirror usually put in intersections. I looked at my reflection to see that I was really young again. Dude, that was sick. Suddenly a voice called me out from behind. I turned and widened my eyes when I saw the familiar looking kid on a bike talking to me. Your skateboard flew into that tree there after you've done your trick. Luke Dunphy pointed at the tree nearby. I turned in the direction he pointed and saw a skateboard with a skull sticker on its bottom hanging in the tree branch. You'd inspired me. I will also fly to the sky after this. The 10 years old Luke said excitedly. I became alarmed and quickly said, no, Luke, don't. The accident really hurt. It wasn't sick at all. It was dangerous, and I'd been irresponsible. I probably will never skate again after this. The boy was stunned by the sudden proclamation. Based on my memory, I was the one who asked him if he wanted to watch a trick before this. For me to backpedal quickly was a bit unexpected for him. Luke. I heard a voice calling for Luke from afar. Both of us turned to look at the caller. A hot blonde milf with scary eyes was calling for Luke from a street over. She shielded her eyes with her hand as the afternoon sun was glaring. Whatever, Luke said, losing his interest as I started to nag like his mom. He put his leg on the pedal and started to cycle back to his house. I stood there frozen for a while with the same thought nagging. Am I in the modern family, TV series, world? Chapter 2, Chapter 2, Me. Now then, what am I, supposed to do here? I asked myself in confusion. Then, I waited for someone to explain the situation to me. I waited for a while, but the only sound I heard was crows cawing at me from the trees. Apparently, my skateboard hit close to its nest, so I didn't think I would ever take it back. Huh. I looked to see the crow watching me with vigilance, so I walked away from the tree. So, there isn't any system to explain this to me? Also, wasn't I supposed to lose my memories? It added to my confusion that I could clearly remember the things from the afterlife and the train station. I took off my skateboard helmet and decided to walk home. I saw the familiar looking house nearby, with Claire whispering something at Luke while looking at me. I wonder what's that about? I muttered. Damn it. Now that I am here, there wasn't a cut scene or anything to put me in perspective of what had just happened. Cut scene, Claire and Luke. Claire admonished her son, what did I tell you, Luke? That thing is dangerous. You should be glad that you didn't fall to the streets. You may break an arm. Sweet. Luke replied, visibly excited. No no, not sweet. Dangerous. Claire crouched down and held Luke's arm. Sweetie, promise me you won't do something like that. Although reluctant, Luke couldn't object to his mother's wishes. I promise. 
Besides, now that he told me it hurts, I will not do the trick, now, Luke said with a slight pause before the last part. Claire didn't notice it and rubbed his hair lovingly. Who is he anyway? Claire asked. He goes to the same high school as Alex. His name is Edward Newgate. Luke replied. It was my first time meeting him, but he's cool. Newgate. Claire asked as she thought about the families around the streets she lived in. You mean that Newgate who lives in the messy house on the next street? With all of their plants dying and everything. Edward POV. So, I'm 14. That's just freaking great, sigh. In the last year of Franklin Middle School and will be going to high school afterward. Apparently, I am a loner in my school and a weird kid, also, kind of, dumb. After I sorted out my memories which were not that many, to begin with, I became exasperated after learning of my new life condition. Basically, I am an unattended, entitled, a snobbish child that thought he was better than everyone else. Growing up as a musical prodigy overblew my ego, I also have a few memories of meeting Dunphy's daughter's duo, but it wasn't a good one. The memories confused me for a while. Am I Edward Newgate or Edward Franzity? The memories came with their feelings, making me doubt my entire existence. I remembered all the things Newgate had gone through, his trauma, his relationship, his love. All of his was also all of mine. I think, I am both now. I sighed and shrugged my shoulders. In this life, I once belonged to a happy family until two years ago. I didn't delve deeper into the memory of the time as I found myself getting harder to breathe. Childhood trauma, huh. My adult mind quickly comprehended the situation, but I wasn't an expert on this matter to deal with this on my own. I finally arrived at my home after a short few minutes of walking. I stopped at the front of the grey-bricked suburban house that was in serious condition. Damn it. I refuse to accept the condition of my house in the memory, but it is really true. Hmm. Why the hell did the people here leave this lawn unattended? I muttered as I stood in front of a detached, two-story suburban home. The rooftop drain was clogged with leaves and other matter. The tall grass on the front lawn was dying, leaving a desolate, yellow-colored meadow in front of the house. Not to mention some stuff that looked like trash was strewn all over the ground. I knew that the house wasn't always like this. But after the mother in the house ran away from her family two years ago, the house's condition deteriorated as there was no one to take care of it. That was also when Edward started to reject everything and everyone around him and became a loner. We have a lot in common in this part, except I never had a family, to begin with, and I was never adopted till I was old enough to leave the orphanage on my own. I know, right? With some proper care, it will be a beautiful home. Suddenly, a familiar voice spoke to me. System. I asked while tilting my head. The man standing behind me was confused, and no. He crouched and tapped my shoulder, causing me to turn. It's me. I widened my eyes as I looked at the man. Never thought the voice was from Phil Dunphy, the local expert on real estate. The man in a blazer was taller than me and had a kind expression on his face. Why are you here? I blurted out. It was so sudden that I didn't manage to plan my sentence ahead. I am the type to constantly think about my words before, but Newgate's experience in speaking like an equal to the adults, and looking down on them had left some traces in my existence. I am from the open house next door, Phil said, pointing at his signs on the next house. My name is Phil Dunphy, Phil said and held his hand out for a handshake. I grabbed his hand instinctively. He smiled at me and asked, Are you interested in home care? Mr. Edward. I introduced myself. Edward. Nice name. You're in high school. Phil asked. I then realized that he didn't know that the house was mine. I guess he was bored from the open house and decided to look around. And now, he found a target to relieve his boredom, me. Yes, I am, I answered curtly with a smile. I noticed Phil looked a bit helpless and started scratching his head as he looked at the house. You know. This house was once very beautiful. There was a huge ornament on the lawn, but the kid inside it had broken it a few years back, he said and started to reminisce. I don't blame Tiki, though. He does his best, in other stuff. Phil muttered. Tiki, I guess that was his nickname for my dad in my new life. He didn't recognize me being Tiki's son, but I don't blame him. I could barely recognize myself if I looked in the mirror. And damn, I really want to look in the mirror. Although I was happy to see Phil, the sight of the house put me in a bad mood. I had a bit of a minor OCD growing up. Okay, I am lying. I have a major OCD growing up. It really irritates me now that I have to live in a place like this. Mr. Dunphy, I called. Hmm, what is it, Edward? Phil asked, turning to me. Being the local real estate expert in Southern California, do you know how I can fix the problems in this house? I asked. What is this? Are you doing a school project? Phil asked. Why did you call me a local expert? I'm not. Phil said with a smile. I saw you on the bus benches before. Aren't you a celebrity realtor? I asked innocently but was secretly pumping Phil with a feeling of elation. Maybe. Just a little bit. Phil replied embarrassingly. He was excited to be the mentor to the young children. And with me buttering him up with the expert moniker, he graciously explained how to fix the house. I already had the skills. What I needed was information. Where can I find the tools necessary? The city's intervention in home care. How do I improve several aspects of my lifestyle? Trash pickup and recycling. We talked for 15 minutes in front of the dilapidated house. I nodded in agreement with most of what he explained. Do you understand now? Wait. Shoot. Don't you need to write about this? A-H-H. I do. I exclaimed in sudden realization. 
Go pick up some papers and meet me at the open house. I will stay there till three in the afternoons, so I can help you with your assignment. Phil offered. Wait. I will be back in a few seconds. No rush, Phil said. His smile turned into a poker face and then a sullen face. As he saw I walked into the house, he called a pigsty to grab my things. Ah, Phil exclaimed in a sudden realization. That's Tiki's son. Phil commentary. The thing is, I don't know that he lives here. Phil leaned forward while sitting on his sofa. His face was sullen, and he shook his legs in nervousness. He said sadly, if only I knew. Commentary ends. Edward POV. I walked into my house after I unlocked the door with the keys underneath the floor mat. Honestly, Newgate was too lax in his safety. The musty smell of the wood and unwashed laundry assaulted my nose as I walked in. The uncleared dishes in the sink and the full trash in the trash can almost make me want to burn down everything in this house and start over someplace else. Beer bottles were strewn all over the living room. Random socks and underpants were in creative places all over the house, such as inside the fridge and the toaster. There was a massive piano in the second living room near the backyard door, certificates of excellence, and trophies in a glass case near the piano. Musical prodigy at nine. Then, Newgate's life starts its downfall. I thought as I read the certificate label inside the glass case. As I peeked in the backyard, I wondered if my house was designed to be part of the forest. I navigated around the messy floor to get to my room on the upper floor of the house. Some broken steps caused me to stumble, so I need to fix that later. Now, let's see what I looked like. I muttered as I stood in front of a mirror. A skinny, 1.7 meter in height kid with wavy brown hair and piercing green eyes was staring back at me. The hair was very Zac Efron in the high school musical. It was long and was combed neatly to the side. I sighed and didn't blame the kid, as the movie's hype was real. My shirt was an official Led Zeppelin t-shirt, so at least I had great taste in music. I turned to look at the rest of the room. A few music records were laid on top of my brown bed sheets and blankets. Newgate could handle various instruments, so they were also inside the room with a speaker. A blood-red electric guitar, drum sets, and also an acoustic guitar. He also has violins and saxophone inside the room. By the bed, a few Led Zeppelin posters, Iron Man posters, and even Twilight posters were hung on the walls. The first thing I changed in this room was ripping off the Twilight poster, crumpling it into a ball, and throwing it into the garbage bin. Luckily, Newgate hung up Bella's poster, not another Edward. Or I will start to question his sexuality. And, of course, no books were inside the room, I muttered in frustration. The date was April 2009, according to the calendar. Summer break would come in late June, so I have to suffer going to a school filled with prepubescent hormones I mean teenagers now. Ah, uh, I groaned and let out a long sigh before I lay facing up on my bed. This sucks. Why do I need to live again? And why did I come here? Many questions were in my mind, but my OCD wouldn't let me think. Ugh, the fucking smell. I gritted my teeth in anger and couldn't hold it in anymore. I ran all over the house and opened all the windows and doors to lessen the smell. I took out a pen and a piece of paper before I ran away, leaving my house in a very dangerous state with the door unlocked. However, I am sure that with the current state of the house, even burglars wouldn't dare to enter. What did I do next? I ran to the house next door where Phil was. Edward. I don't mean to be rude. Phil said, loading up for an apology, but I cut him off. Can you elaborate? What do you mean that the house will be beautiful with some proper care? I asked hurriedly. Ah, this. UMM. Let's see here. First, you can start by. Chapter 3, Chapter 3, Clean Up. Edward POV. So, can you drive me to the grocery store? I badgered Phil, who had just finished his open house. I have to go pick up my daughter after her cello practice, so I don't dash. What time do you need to pick her up? I cut him off again. I knew that Phil had a soft spot for struggling kids. That's why he used to take care of his neighbor's kid before. He looked quite reluctant before he agreed. I guess he was guilty about bad-mouthing my house to the owner's face. He was kind enough to treat me like an equal, and I felt a little bad for manipulating him, but if I needed to stay at that house, I couldn't let the situation there stay the same. At 4.30, Phil replied and glanced at his watch. That's fine. I will only be there for a few minutes. I need to grab a few things to clean the house. Your advice is great. I can't wait to use it. I buttered him up. He broke into a smile and said, okay, but I will bring my son with me. He loves going to the grocery store. It was the weekend, so the kids didn't go to school. Incidentally, this was also when my dad had the most jobs, so I couldn't formally meet him until Monday. Luke, I just met him earlier. I said, cool. Then I don't have to introduce you guys. Phil said and walked to his car a Toyota sedan. Wait, don't you have to tell your dad about this? He asked. No, it's fine. I answered. You should pick up Luke first and then stop by. I need to do something first. Phil looked at the opened wide door on my house and nodded before he drove away. Reluctantly, I returned to my house to pick up my money and took out the trash along the way. I peeked at the fridge to see nothing inside. Not even bottled water. The fridge was totally empty, except for some beers. I checked for my necessities and found out that I was living as if I was inside a camp. I need a new toothbrush and toothpaste. Luckily, my dad bought me an iPhone, no doubt as an act to buy my love, as he couldn't be there for me much. I listed the things I needed to buy and took some cash from my dad's hiding place. 200 bucks will be enough. 
I think. I texted my dad about the expense, as I am responsible. I needed to change my shirt as I was sweating a lot while playing in the streets. I wore a relatively new gray shirt and some jeans after I took a light shower to clean the sweat from my body. Dunphy's house. Luke. We're going to the grocery store. Phil said excitedly as he took off his work blazer. He changed into a collared shirt with a horizontal purple and black pattern. From upstairs, Luke replied, Okay, I just need to put on some pants. With a laundry basket in her hand, Claire showed up in front of Phil as he waited for Luke by the stairs. Why? Claire asked with a suspicious expression. I just went to the store this morning. Nothing. I just need a few things. And I need to get. Alex SSSSS. Phil stammered and couldn't continue. His head moved as he lengthened his last word, blinking a few times anxiously. Claire nodded in understanding and didn't continue her interrogation, just don't play too much at the massage chair, all right? I don't want you and Luke to be kicked out again. Phil watched her leave and then breathed a sigh of relief. Luke came down while wearing multiple pants at the same time. Luke buddy, that's awesome. Phil laughed as he watched Luke's tight legs. If I wear enough pants, it won't hurt when I fall on the floor again, Luke said. Yeah, but what about your elbows and your body? Phil asked. And your head. Ugh, that's right. Luke replied. Claire swooped in like a ninja before the situation worsened. Luke. Only one pair of pants. She gives a stern look at Phil, honey. Phil avoided her eyes and turned to Luke, maybe next time, buddy. Edward POV. Hey, you clean up nice. Phil smiled excitedly as he rolled his car windows down. With my hair combed and my face washed, I almost looked like a different guy. Instead of leaving my hair like Zac Efron with the bangs, I pulled it back and styled it to make it seem less childish. Hop in. Let's go. Phil said excitedly. Okay. I entered the car and found Luke in the back seat. Why don't you sit in the front? I asked curiously. Haley won't let me. She will kill me if I do. Luke replied in a childish voice. Also, this is your house. Luke asked as he saw the horrible sight. It looks like a horror mansion. He said excitedly. Luke. Don't be rude. Phil interjected. No, no. That was exactly what I was going for. I said, as I knew Luke didn't have any bad intentions. But I couldn't let it stay this way any longer, so burn the sight in your mind before it disappears. I sat next to Luke in the back seat and pulled the seat belt. Nice job, buddy. Safety first. Phil complimented me. I couldn't tell him I was afraid of riding in cars, right? That's why I only had a scooter in my previous life. My heart always palpitates when I'm inside a car, but that feeling didn't transmigrate with me in my new life. Thank God. I blurted out, and the feeling of relief washed me over. What do you say, buddy? Phil asked. Nothing. Is the grocery store far away? We'll be there in five minutes. Quickly, we arrived at the grocery store. Luke and Phil played with the trolley, hitting each other with it while I continuously put some stuff inside it. I need eggs, flour, cooking oil, and milk, I muttered as I finished taking care of my necessities. A new towel, some fresh produce, and many cleaning utensils. Phil stood before the Uncle Ben cookie section and yelled, No, -o. Uncle Ben. I played along, Peter, remember, with great power. Phil continued, comes great electricity bill. Ha ha ha. Dad, that's gold. Luke guffawed loudly at the side. Even I chuckled a bit at the joke. After a short time, put the stuff in the trolley. Buddy, you're sure about this? That's a lot of stuff. Phil asked as the trolley was half full. Yeah, I've been calculating the price in my mind. I think I will still have $1.79, $1.79, after I finish. Wait, you can calculate in your mind. Luke asked, his impression of me seemingly becoming much better. Yeah, buddy, are you sure? There is also a tax factor. Phil said he, too, was impressed. Not by my mathematical skill but by my commitment to calculating the entire time I'm shopping. Also, $1.79? Are you sure? That's very specific. Phil asked challengingly. Want to bet? I smirked. Phil smiled and nodded slightly before he answered. Okay, if you're correct, I will give you, this hat. He pulled out a funny looking hat from the counter and put it on his head. It was a white fedora with a big fake diamond on it, or at least I think it was a diamond. Not that. If I am right, then buy me some soda. I said, not wanting much. No hat. Phil reluctantly said. No, I replied decisively. We got to the cashier, and he started to scan my items. Come on. Come on. Phil muttered as he watched the price getting nearer and nearer to the target. 198 is the mark, Phil muttered. Even Luke started to chant beside Phil. The duo was really similar to each other. Cashier, final price is $199.71. Oh, so close. Phil exclaimed. Better luck next time, buddy. You only have a balance of 29 cents now. Wait. You need to minus $1.50 from my total. I said. Add that to my balance, and it will be $1.79. So, I am right. Buddy, it doesn't matter if you're wrong. As long as you bring enough money. Phil tried to comfort me, thinking that I really wanted the soda. Inwardly, he planned to go to a drive through after this to buy some sodas and some food for us. That's not it. $1.50 cause of the candy bar Luke put in the trolley as he thought no one would notice. I said. Luke widened his eyes while Phil stared at him. Luke, is it true? What? Aren't we going grocery shopping? 
Mom always buys me a candy bar after. Luke gave excuses as he started to rummage through the plastic bags to get his candy bar out. He played the situation innocently in front of his father, who almost got fooled. Yeah, but you do it without asking. I can buy you a candy bar. You don't have to hide it from me. Phil said. It didn't bother me as it was only a candy, so before Phil scolded Luke, I interjected, it's okay. Consider it a payment for him. That'll work, Luke said hurriedly. Payment for what? Phil asked. Phil and I walked side by side in the parking lot to get to his Toyota. Struggling a few meters behind us was Luke carrying all the bags alone. I shouldn't have agreed to do it. A-H-H. Luke groaned as he stepped briskly toward the car. Come on, buddy, just a few more steps. Phil encouraged him as he opened up the car bonnet. I will never take a job from you again, Luke said angrily. I chuckled and said, really? Not even if the job is to eat cake. Luke became stunned and fell into deep contemplation. I chuckled and entered the car first. Oh shoot. We have to pick up Alex. Phil looked at his car clock and said hurriedly. Luke entered the car and shut the door. We shouldn't have done the massage chair, Luke. Phil said anxiously. The grocery stuff took only 20 minutes, and I knew what to buy. The rest of the time, Phil and Luke mess around in the grocery store. Phil quickly exited the parking lot. Edward, I will get you your soda later. It's okay, I replied. What about me? Luke asked, wanting some soda, too, especially after the heavy work he'd just done. You already have your candy bar. I teased him. He sulked on his seat and crossed his arms. I patted his head and let out a laugh. We arrived at Alex's music teacher's house in 20 minutes. Alex was already standing outside with her cello bag on the ground. Shoot. She looks angry. Phil said. He tried to take off his seatbelt, but it was stuck as he pulled on it too fast. No, no, no. He muttered. Let me help Mr. Dunphy. I offered. Phil was still struggling with his seatbelt. Thank you, but I just need a few minutes to take this off dash. While he said that, I was already outside of the car. What? Phil mumbled as he watched me walk toward Alex with widened eyes. Hi, Alex Dunphy, right? I asked, pretending that I didn't know her. A bit stunned by the sudden development, Alex crossed her arms and asked me in a guarded tone, Newgate, right? Why did you come out of my dad's car? She did her hair in a ponytail and wore a long-sleeved yellow shirt. Her rectangular glasses really framed her face. She looked a bit older than the actress playing her in season 1. If compared, she was similar to the season 3 Alex right now. Your dad took me to the grocery store. You play the cello. I asked as I helped her pick up the giant instrument. Why did he take you to the grocery store? Alex squinted her eyes, even confused now. I smiled at her and opened up the back of the car. Cause he is a kind man, I replied and helped her load up the cello. The cello's giant size almost squashes my produce goods, but I don't care much about it. Food is food. It didn't matter if it was squashed. Alex walked to the front seat next to the driver and asked Phil hurriedly, but in a whisper, why is he here? He asked me for a favor. So, I helped him. Phil replied. You know he is a problem kid, right? Always late to class. Always absent. Rude. Alex complained. Really? But he is smart, though. Phil asked, confused. Smart? What do you mean by smart? He is as dumb as Haley and Luke. Alex said while rolling her eyes. If he is smart, that means Haley is also smart. I entered the car during their argument without them noticing. Mr. Dunphy, it's done, I said after watching them argue for a while. When did you get in? Phil asked in shock. For a while now, Luke said while laughing. Also, Alex, I'm sorry I was rude to you before in school, I said sincerely. Whatever. Alex crossed her arms and looked forward in the car to ignore me. Apparently, the previous me and she had crossed paths a few times in middle school. Inside the car, Phil suddenly offered, I will drop Alex off at the house, and then, we will go to your house. Luke and I will help you clean it up. I saw the clock, and it was almost 5 in the evening. No need Phil. The deal was to bring me to the store. I am thankful for the offer, but I think you should go and rest. He has work today, so I didn't want to bother him anymore. He insisted, but I declined politely. Okay, if you are sure. Phil said, a bit sad. He liked spending time with Edward and didn't want it to end as he didn't know when was the next time he could do that again. Alex rolled her eyes aside as she thought her dad wanted to play with the neighborhood kid. We arrived in front of my godforsaken house in no time. You live in this dump? It suits you? Alex said sarcastically. She didn't come out of the car even when Luke and Phil were helping me bring the groceries inside. I leaned next to her door, and she rolled down her windows slightly to talk, or mock. Come by a week later. Your dad taught me some stuff I will use to change this dump to a livable place. I said, wanting to have a cigarette in my hand. Why would I ever come to your house? Alex mocked. That's, true. I agreed. I could handle speaking casually to Alex and the Dunphy because of their influence on me in my previous life. Although I'd entered their world, it's not like I was suddenly a part of their life. The reason why I was so comfortable with them was the familiarity they exuded in my very being. Maybe the stress of transmigration, or maybe reincarnation was too much that I hid the insecurity and intrusive thoughts by being with my comfort characters. I was also feeling a bit complicated inside, now that they were no longer actors and actresses that were acting, what should I think of them then? Will they still be a sitcom cast that I love, or my opinions on them would change once I saw things that weren't following the sitcom's character sheets? 
I do wish life would no longer be complicated in this one, but it's impossible, huh? I thought. Alex was taken aback as I agreed with her words, and the silence was suffocating her. She thought that I was hurt by her sarcastic remarks and insults. The socially awkward teenager started to get anxious and wanted to make amends. She tapped on the window to call me, but I ignored her as I noticed Phil and Luke were done putting the stuff inside the house. I turned to Alex before I walked to my house. By the way, Alex. What? You're even cuter now. I flashed a charming smile as I said that. She was flabbergasted and decided to call me names, but I'd already moved away from the car. It's true, though. She was even cuter than in the TV series. Although similar to their actors and actresses, she and Luke also gained Claire and Phil's physical characteristics in the real world. I guess that makes sense because if they didn't look similar, people would have wondered if Claire cheated on Phil to get their children or adopt them from somewhere. Remember, the recycling truck will come tomorrow, and the garbage truck on Monday and Thursday. Phil reminded me before he left. I wanted to know when I would get the chance to meet them again. Back in the house, I wore an apron, rubber gloves, and a hair protector, and I held a big trash bag in my left hand while facing my worst enemy, the messy house. Let's do this. I put on my playlist, or the previous Edward Albums records, and lost myself in cleaning the house. The liquor bottles in front of the TV, vacuuming the sofa and sucking up all the Doritos fall into its crack, dusting the ceiling fan, arranging the magazines, and just cleaning for hours. Grolyolo, a slash n, sound effect lol. My stomach let out a grumble as I continued cleaning the house nonstop. I was putting the laundry in the dryers when it happened. It's 9 o'clock. I should make some dinner. I muttered as I walked to the now clean kitchen. I opened the fridge and took out a steamed rice pack before putting it in the oven. I sliced some bacon and sausages before I prepared the onions, garlic, chilies, and other ingredients for fried rice. I blend all the mix together to create the seasoning. When the pan was hot enough, I poured a little oil and started to fry the onion mix. After a while, a long-lost smell of homemade cooking began filling the house's air, pushing the musty wood smell away. I put the bacon and the sausages and fried them together with the onion mix before I put in the rice. To top it off, I fried an egg and placed it on top of my fried rice. Ah, uh, lacking, I muttered in dissatisfaction as I continued eating. After filling my stomach, I resumed my work in cleaning the house. It took until 11 when I was satisfied enough to make this a place to stay for a night. I will continue cleaning the house, the backyard, and the front yard tomorrow, I muttered as I fell asleep on top of a fresh bed sheet I just took out from the dryer. Third party POV. Stopping at the front door of the Newgate house, a tall, tanned man in a ship's captain outfit staggered drunkenly as he unlocked the door. Edward's father finally came home after working for the entire day. His work as a cruise ship captain didn't allow him to spend much time with his son, even if he wanted to. What? Did Edward hire a cleaning lady? Ted Newgate rubbed his eyes as he saw the clean interior as he walked in. He double-checked to ensure he was in the right house and was greatly confused by the situation. Before he slept, he walked to the kitchen to get a can of beer. As he approached the kitchen, he saw a plate wrapped in tinfoil on the kitchen counter. Is that for me? He asked. His son was already asleep, so he couldn't get an answer. He took the plate and sat on the dinner table before opening it up. There, a still warm plateful of fried rice was waiting for him. He took a spoonful of a bite and sat quietly as he ate the dish. Dunphy's house. Kitchen. So, you took him shopping. Claire interrogated Phil after Alex reported that Phil was spending time with a strange boy to her. Yes. You know their family condition. He reached out to me. How could I say no? Phil defended himself. Although he did something nice, he still felt guilty when Claire asked him. He didn't know why. Okay, philosophy come down. Claire said reassuringly. I am not mad. He didn't use your money or buy any dangerous stuff, right? Then, it's fine. Really? Phil asked. Also, he's a very smart kid. He can do long and complete calculations in his mind. No, no. Alex said he is dumb. Claire objected. Maybe he just didn't try before this. Cause, you know, his mother ran away and everything. Now that he is more mature, I guess he wants to change his life. I want to be there to support him. He can add the grocery price and also factor in the tax, Claire. He is talented. That's great, but are you the perfect person for that? Claire replied with unconvinced eyes while sipping her cup of tea. A few meters away by the living room, Alex was reading a book while Haley was texting on her phone. Luke was sitting on the floor to watch TV. Suddenly, Alex turned to Haley and asked, When a boy tells you, you're even cuter now, what does that mean? Haley replied without looking up from her phone and being interested, it means he already thought I was cute before this. And even more so now. Also, don't talk to me. Oh, Alex exclaimed before she hid her face in the book. A slash N, I have till chapter 10 ready, but I need the editor's help to go through them first. I will upload them all by this Friday. Chapter 4, Chapter 4, Karmic Gotcha. A slash N, three more chapter today. As Edward lost himself in dreamland, he was taken to a pure white room with only a lottery-based box inside the room. Edward POV. Wait, what? Where am I? I asked as I looked around the room. There wasn't anyone other than me here. Am I dreaming? However, the situation felt so lucid that I instinctively knew I was not. I walked to the only thing inside the room, the little black box. On top of it, I found a paper file with the label Karmic Gotcha on it. 
A lone match stuck to the document's first page, causing me to wonder what it could be used for. Gotcha. I wondered for a while before I picked up the file. As I picked it up, I remembered what the Grim Reaper had told me. He said that I have a gift waiting for me or something, is this it? I opened the file before me and started to read the document inside. The documents explained the gift I'd received from the Afterlife Corporation and a letter from them. I read the letter first to further understand my current situation. I don't know why, but I instinctively read the letter using Professor McGonagall's voice. Dear Mr. Edward Newgate, We are pleased to inform you that your connection to the Afterlife Karmic System has been successful. You're now among the few in the infinite customers of the Afterlife that could use the Karmic System to become an agent of the Afterlife. Please refer to the guidelines inside the files to study more about the method to activate the lottery processes and details about being an Afterlife agent. As you had accidentally wandered toward purgatory, we have prepared compensation for you in the form of a higher level gotcha that you could use in this session. Be warned. You could only connect to the afterlife during the day of life and death. Please make sure to understand the rules before exiting your first session. Otherwise, the afterlife system would be forced to shut down. That's all from us now in the afterlife corporation. We hope to not see you again for a very long time. Good luck. Hmm. The letter felt ominous to me for a reason. I turned to the documents inside the file and took some time to read about them. A-H-H. An agent will use their karma to trade with the members of the afterlife for their memories, knowledge, skills, talents, or special abilities. That's nice. In turn, the usage of the skills and the deeds I did with them could either add to their wealth in the afterlife with good karma or plunge them down into purgatory with bad karma. As many afterlife members chose to gamble, I could only use the lottery system to draw out my prize for fairness between the members. If my luck is good, I can get their talents or special ability. If my luck is bad, I will only get a snippet of their memories. One minute of memory is too little, isn't it? As I read deeper into the guidelines, I discovered that the quality was split into five different levels. White, green, purple, red, gold. For example, a white memory gotcha will only give me one minute snippets of the afterlife member that I draw out, while a golden one will show me their whole lifetime. The white prize was random, but as it increased in quality, I could get a specific training memory or essential information. The knowledge referred to the knowledge the afterlife member had in their lifetime. For example, if I have Batman as my gotcha prize, I could receive his knowledge from his AI building or even techniques to pick up girls. The quality differed by the levels of draws I'd made, same as the memories. Skill was the combination of knowledge and memories. If I drew knowledge, I needed to make it into skills independently, but skills gotcha gave me the experience and the knowledge to do it. It also helps my body develop the templates to achieve the skill, whether gradually or instantly, depending on my adaptability. Talents and special abilities are in a category of their own. Talents could give me additional IQ points or an athletic body and the necessary knowledge to grow it. While special abilities allowed me to get even an esper type ability such as telepathy, telekinesis, flight, and many more. If I get a dud one, maybe a talent to slip on a banana peel at a comedic hour or esper's ability to make stuff stick on my body. I don't know if the lucky pervert's ability is a dud or a win. However, the draw rate for this type was especially low. Not even 0.1% dot. The day of life and death referred to the day I felt close to any of them. My birthday, the day of the dead, Halloween, and more. With a minimum of four times a year for the gotcha, I looked at the piece of paper that showed my karma points and how to roll a gotcha. Edward Newgate. Karma point, plus VE 750, 666 afterlife bonus, VE minus 0.5. One gotcha roll, six, karma points. One high quality roll, green and above 66, karma points. One special category roll, 666, karma points. One negative roll, 6 slash 66 slash 666, karma point. Afterlife ticket, not yet issued, but guaranteed one. What does that suppose to mean? I muttered as I looked at the last sentence. I referred back to the documents but needed help finding the related information regarding the afterlife ticket. Will my ticket from my past life be carried forward here? Not finding the answers, I checked my karmic points section to understand how I could get points for my actions. I received 84 karma points today, on the first day of my new life. The numbers excite me as I estimated I would have many karmic points during my next session. The karmic point would only be tallied in the white space. An average person would only have their karmic point tallied if they died and were brought to the afterlife. Only agents could know their numbers as a privilege. I received 20 points for cleaning my house. 30 points from my father, who knows what's that about. And the other 28 were from my interaction with the Dunphy. Advising Luke not to make a dangerous skateboard trick, 2 points. Apologizing to Alex, 5 points. The rest of the points were from my interaction throughout the day. However, I realized that the same actions would bring different numbers of points in my subsequent interactions with them. Same thing with cleaning the house. The next time I cleaned the house, it wouldn't give me any karmic points or less karmic points. To get many karmic points, I need to do something drastic, whether it impacts my life or the lives of others around me. It would be difficult for me as I don't really get out of the house much. After flipping the pages and rereading the terms of the condition multiple times, I sighed and finally decided to use my gotcha for the first time. System, I want to use the gotcha. Hehe. <laughs> I laughed to myself after mimicking the novels that I had read in the past. 
The lottery system here was more complicated than that. There was a form I needed to fill out on the last pages of the document. I needed to burn the paper to submit it to the afterlife communities. Luckily, the paper responded to my thoughts. I don't bring my pen here to fill it normally. I filled out the form for one high-quality gotcha roll, three regular rolls, and one special ability roll, completely using up my karma points. I used the match stuck on the document's front page to burn my form. The paper caught fire instantly and disappeared. Seconds later, I heard the sounds of lottery balls coming inside the black box in front of me. So, I need to insert my hand through the hole and fish it out. I stood in front of the box and tried to peek at the balls through the hole, but I saw nothing. Hmm. First is. Normal gotcha? Please. I announced it as part of the procedure. Now I would get a normal gotcha roll from the lottery. I inserted my hand inside the hole and rummaged around before pulling out a lotto ball. Oh, a purple one. I exclaimed excitedly before I read the prize on the ball. For fun, I covered up the writings on the ball on the one hand and read it like I was in a variety show. Knowledge. That's useful. Who is it from? I asked before I lowered my hand to read another sentence. Beth Harmon, who is this? I tilted my head and realized that it was stupid of me to create intrigue if I didn't know who the knowledge owner was. He slash she could be any random person in the world. The full line on the ball read, knowledge, Beth Harmon, chess, a slash n, queen's gambit. I waited for a while, but the sudden influx of chess information didn't appear in my mind. Oh, I forgot. I will get it after I wake up tomorrow. I already predicted that I would have an intense headache tomorrow morning. I prepared for the second normal gotcha before I inserted my hand inside the black box. Oh, a white one. I muttered in a flat tone. Although it was a white quality roll, it would be helpful to me later if what was on it was good. Talent, Leonard Hofstadter. IQ plus 30. The talent didn't come with additional knowledge or skills to grow it, as it was just an additional stat gotcha. Phew. It's good that I don't get his talent for groveling. Also, is Leonard dead? That is quite saddening. I would like to know if it was the same Leonard Hofstadter from the shows I watched before, as I have no other information about the man. But it was fun to assume. Last normal roll. A purple ball was pulled out of the black box. Memories, Hiroma Yoichi, football training. Wait. How long will the memory be? I muttered. I reread the document and discovered I could hold on to the memory for an indeterminate amount of time. I will check this out later. I threw the matter to the back of my mind after storing the memory someplace safe. Next. High quality roll, please. I announced, keeping the final prize for last. Tata 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 I could hear the sound of the prize inside the box rearranging itself. I inserted my hand and pulled out a red ball. Talent, Edna mode, fashion. Hmm, Edna? Why does this feel like that dwarf ant? I muttered. The talent would be helpful for me in creating my own clothes or if I want to create my own clothing line in this world, which was something I needed to take some time to think about. The last roll makes me quiver in excitement. Special category roll, please. Tata 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 the balls inside the box were rearranged for the last roll in the session. I put my hand inside the box and rummaged, carefully feeling each ball. Hmm. I procrastinated for a few minutes, just changing my decision from one ball to another before I finally decided to pull out a golden ball. Gold? Yes. I screamed in excitement as I hurriedly read the writings on the ball. Special ability. May had some. Machinery. Oh, a machinery-related prize. Nice. Finally finished my roll for today. I put the file back in the box, covering the lottery hole connected to the afterlife. The last gotcha category, the negative gotcha, needed me to receive the negative karma of the afterlife member in exchange for a roll. A negative gotcha has the minimum red quality roll in the lottery. However, Edward decided to use the negative gotcha once he understood how the karmic system works. He took time to reread the documents, but the stacks of paper were too many for him to read in only one session. Now, I simultaneously couldn't wait for tomorrow and wanted tomorrow to not come. Tomorrow is Sunday, so I have another day before school. But my home life improvement makes me shudder as I would have to work very hard tomorrow to make my home into a place worth living. The white space soon disappeared and placed me back into the mortal world, where I could continue my dream of flying on top of a spaceship. Although I read the document carefully, the gotcha excitement caused me to forget about a tiny little detail inside the file of something I had already read. I have a good role today because of the positive karma I had before I spent all of it away. The file read, when the negative karma was higher than the positive karma, the owner of the karma would be riddled with bad luck until the next session where he collected enough positive karma to surpass the negative one. And I'd used up all of my positive karma during the rolls. I would have to stay that way until the next session when they tally my karma points. The following day came quickly. I woke up at 8am, unlike the previous Edward, who'd liked to sleep in and woke up around noon. Living and caring for an elder for a while, I developed the habit of waking up and starting my day early. My teenage body woke up healthily, but I don't care anymore. The longing to meet up with Noni in the morning almost pushed me down into a depression, but my OCD caused me to get out of bed to finish my improvement around the house. The moment I stood up from the bed, the assault came. Taking a bottle of water from my nightstand, I decided to drink some water to ease the headache. I didn't notice a few drops of water falling into my pants while drinking. Uh, my head, so last night was real. I muttered as I was suddenly assaulted by countless pieces of information about machinery, chess, and fashion. 
My fashion knowledge also included interior designs, so the sight of my room after that caused me to get sick in the stomach. Sue, uncultured. I muttered. I also instinctively hate capes, so I guess that Edna was the Edna I thought of. May Hatsum's machinery ability allowed me to bring my ideas to life, but at the risk of an explosion. I need to be careful in using her special ability later. Oh, I exclaimed after I saw my dad in his ship captain's uniform standing in front of my bedroom door as I wanted to walk out. Oh, Ed, you woke up early today. Ted stammered awkwardly as it's been a while since he talked to his son in his sober state. He has a big beer belly and a height of 1.85 meters tall. Some of his hair had turned gray, especially at the side of his head, as he was almost 45 this year. Yay, I have some stuff to do. I looked at the man suspiciously as I knew he would go to work during daybreak on the weekends. Did you get fired? I asked him. What? No. Ted was taken aback. I'd taken only the afternoon cruise today and thought we could hang out in the docks like we did before. Referring to my memories, I knew that Edward, that is me, would go to the docks with my mother and father on the weekends, even following along the cruise ride sometimes. But after mom ran away, I stopped spending some time with my family. As I didn't respond, Ted started to backpedal hurriedly, of course you don't have to if you don't want to. Seeing his sincerity, I sighed inwardly. Okay, let's go, but I need $100 after this. Ted didn't mind about the money one bit. He also knew that Edward had taken $200 from the emergency cash to buy some groceries and some stuff for the house that he forgot to take care of. It's fine. I narrowed my eyes at him for the easy answer. Suddenly, I blurted out, you should ask me what I'm going to use it for. What if I buy drugs with the money? I don't even know why I do that. Maybe Edward's resentment toward his father was bubbling up to the surface, and now I'd received the brunt of it. Ted was stunned, and I noticed that his eyes started to blink at a different frequency from one another. Oh, that's why Phil calls him Ticky. He has a lot of ticks. I thought secretly. R dash, are you going to buy drugs with the, the money? Ted asked with a stammer. I chuckled at him as I was the one who was currently parenting my supposed parent in this world. No, I don't. I need to buy some tools to fix the front lawn. I answered honestly. Ted broke out into a broad smile and said, Okay, I will give it to you on the docks after I get some cash from the ATM. Let me take a bath first, I said. It was my habit to shower in the morning, but the previous Edward needed to improve his hygiene. Ted was confused, but suddenly he saw my healthy state on my pants and came to a conclusion of his own. I understand, son. Take your time. Also, you've grown up now, Ted said and patted my shoulder. I looked at him confusingly and then finally noticed my healthy state and some wet spots on my pants. Wait. No, I didn't. I screamed, but Ted had already sniggered away. Chapter 5, Chapter 5, Haven't I Always Been Unlucky? In the Kitchen. After I took a shower and changed into a new shirt, I took out ciabatta bread, some bacon, American cheese, two eggs, melted some butter, and took out a hot sauce bottle from the fridge. Finally, being in the kitchen didn't bother me anymore after cleaning it up yesterday. There are some areas that could be improved, but I would do that later. Sit down. I'm going to make an egg salad sandwich. I said to my dad. We can just eat on the pier, Ted replied, seeming uncomfortable in the kitchen in this house. Who says I'm going to make one for you? I replied playfully as I heated up the grill and put bacon on it. The bacon started to sizzle on the grill, and the smell filled the air. Ted watched Edward cooking silently. He got the melted butter on the cut ciabatta bread and put it on the grill, cracked two eggs open, and put cheese on the eggs when they were done. Edward closed the egg with cheese using a lid to melt the cheese more quickly. He put the ready bacon on the bread before he put the eggs on top of the bacon. To top it off, Edward puts two dashes of hot sauce on top of the eggs. Not too much, only two small drops. It would be easier to taste the cheese if it's less. A slash N, recipe from Harley Quinn sandwich. When did you learn to do all of this? Ted asked. He couldn't shake the horrible feeling inside of him that he had been neglecting his son for a long time and didn't even know what to do now. I cook sometimes, I said while putting the sandwich inside a wrapper before I cut it in half. One for me. Ted asked hesitatingly while smiling. I stared at him for a few seconds before giving him one. Ted took a bite out of what he considered his son's original recipe, as he never saw a sandwich like this before. Oh, my God. Ted widened his eyes in excitement as the flavor exploded in his mouth. It's so good. I smiled as I watched Ted devour the sandwich in just a few seconds while I only got two bites out of it. His eyes moved toward the sandwich in my hands after he finished his. No, this is mine, I said hurriedly. However, the bottom of the wrapper that I wrapped nicely opened up, causing some bacon to fall on my shirt, staining it. I won't take it. Don't worry, Ted said reassuringly. However, his hungry eyes caused me to be wary about it. I used a napkin to wipe off the stain, but it wouldn't come off. Guess I have to change again. I quickly finished my sandwich while I prepared a cup of coffee. You bought coffee too? Ted asked in astonishment. Yeah, how do you like your coffee? With milk or black? I asked. Black, Ted replied. I poured him a cup of coffee from the Italian brand coffee I found in the grocery store yesterday. It was the same coffee Noni, Granny, always drank before she got her stroke. I took my coffee with some milk because of my childish taste buds which irked me. This is good. I guess we don't need to have breakfast outside. Ted said. 
I don't think that it's already enough for you, I said, looking at Ted's bulging stomach. He was embarrassed by my gaze and replied with a stutter, I, I think this is F fine. We should go now. As my dad and I walked outside the house, the sight of the lawn put me back in a bad mood. I swear I will clean this all up today. Come on, Ed, Ted called me from the car. I'm coming, I replied and entered the car's front seat, sitting next to the driver. So, Ed, have you thought about what you're going to do for your birthday party next month? Ted asked while they were stuck in traffic. Why are there a lot of people going to the pier? I replied, not answering Ted's question. For a kid, the prospect of a birthday party and gifts may excite them, but it was too childish for me now. They are going to the farmer's market, I guess, Ted replied. He thought that his son was a bit uncomfortable with bringing up the topic as he hadn't celebrated Edward's birthday with him for two years. Farmer's market. I muttered. Can we take a look? I thought. Never mind. Let's go take a look. Ted said a bit sadly. But we need to finish before 10 am. I glanced at the clock, and it was 9.16 am now. It's okay. I just want to see what it looks like. I always saw a farmer's market scene in television series before, but I had never actually visited one. Ted quickly parked the car, and we entered the farmer's market. Ted's captain uniform felt out of place here, earning him a few second glances from the veggies and people with same-sex partners. Further away from where Edward and Ted were walking. Oh my god, Mitch, look. Kim pointed at the family duo from afar. That is so cute. A father brings his son to the farmer's market before work. Isn't that adorable? Mitchell raised his head from the vegetable stand and turned toward the father-son duo's direction. Cam. It's obvious the dad didn't want to come here. You're being skeptical. I'd like to think after we, whisper, come back from Vietnam with the cargo, normal voice, you will try to be more positive. Okay, please stop referring to our baby as cargo. What else am I supposed to say? You banned me from using the word B-A-B-Y. That's because you keep bringing it up to everyone. Mitchell said exasperatingly. He had a secret, he'd never told his family about him trying to adopt a baby. Every time Cam brought up the topic, his nerve was instantly dialed to 11. He needed to ensure that no one knew about it. Suddenly, a voice sounded from behind Mitchell. You guys are having a baby. I asked unconsciously. I was walking to the vegetable stand when I accidentally heard the conversation between Cam and Mitch. So that means I'm here before the pilot starts. Why, do you think two guys couldn't have a baby? Cam said defensively while getting up in my face. Ted narrowed his eyes at Cam, wanting to step in, but his son covered it. How do you get that from a question? It's not like I'd asked it rudely. I blurted out. What is wrong with me today? Kim realized that he had jumped to conclusions, I'm sorry. It's been a tumultuous time for us. Even Mitchell nodded at the side. Sorry. Usually, people will instantly judge us when we bring it up. Kim added, yeah, and added with the look you're going to hell as they do so. It's okay. I don't mind it. Congratulations on your new baby. I said politely. Ted suddenly realized who Mitch was. Aren't you Phil's brother? Brother-in-law. I'm. Claire's brother. Mitchell replied puzzledly and shook hands with Ted. And who might you be? I am Theodore Newgate. I live a few streets away from philosophy. Ted said, A-H-H, I see. Nice to meet you then. Mitchell replied, By the way, not many people can look good in a uniform, but you do, Kim added. Ted and Cam introduced themselves while I studied their apparel. Ah, my fashion talent is kicking in. I saw a few things that could have been improved, although the couple tried hard to dress perfectly following the occasion they were in. Ed, we need to go. Ted said while looking at his watch. Mitch and Cam were cooler than he thought but needed to be on the pier at 10.15 am because he planned to bring Edward on a boat ride this morning before he went to work. By the way, where did you buy your pants? I said while studying Mitchell's pants. It's very nice and stylish. Mitchell beamed up and said shyly, really. He even posed using his legs for me to see more of the pants. What about my pants? Kim interjected while posing like a model. I shrugged and replied dismissively, eh, they are all right. Kim was offended by that statement while Mitchell laughed at him. Mitch and Kim commentary. Mitch said, ah. I don't get along with many boys, but Edward is different. Kem pursed his lips as he was offended, maybe to you. Mitchell rolled his eyes and patted Kem's shoulder. Wasn't that you who invited a minor to go shopping with us, just to prove that you have a taste in clothes. End commentary. You know, if you love these pants, we can bring you to the boutique that Mitchell got them from, Kem said. Mitch widened his eyes and tried to salvage the situation, but I thought, why not? Sure. I am not free today, but if you have time tomorrow, you can pick me up after school. Sure. It's a date. Kem said happily. I widened my eyes as I heard the word date. Even Ted smiled uncomfortably hearing that. Cam's eyes shook, and he became flustered. You know what I mean, he said hesitatingly. Mitch and Kim commentary. Mitchell stared at Kim while he avoided Mitchell's eyes. After the farmer's market, my dad brought me into his leisure ship on the pier. It's been a while, huh, son. Ted said while he was holding the steering of the ship. Behind the wheels, his awkwardness, problems, and even ticks disappeared, showing me his rare capable side. Yeah, I replied as I watched the sea. The sea view calmed me down. When I woke up this morning, I remembered that I died, pretty recently too. The lottery, shopping, cleaning the house. I've been keeping myself busy to avoid being swept away by my new reality. Ed, are you, mad at me? Ted suddenly asked, breaking the silence. 
Why would I be mad at you? I replied. I already knew that what happened two years ago wasn't my dad's fault. The previous me didn't think the same, though. He felt that his dad was to blame for his mom running away from their family. Even if that was true, Ted stayed behind. He had to take many more jobs to sustain the family as the divorce fucked his financials, but he tried his best to be there for Edward. Although the house was neglected, he bought Edward his clothes, prepared stuff for his school, and tried to be there for Ed the best way he could. Ted didn't reply. Both the father-son duo silently enjoyed the view before the son got a bit naughty. Dad, are you never going on a date? I asked. Ted widened his eyes and almost spit out his drink as I calculated the perfect moment to ask the question. Why so suddenly? Ted asked in a panic. I don't know. It's been a while. You can move on, you know. I won't blame you for it. Ed. Ted tried to stop me from continuing. I know that you're a man too. Move on. Dating, one night stands, or going to bars. Find someone for you too. I said teasingly. Ted widened his eyes in horror as his son continued speaking. I know models like to rent boats. So, enjoy yourself with one or three of them. Okay. Okay. Just stop. Ted said and quickly turned his boat around. There is a new lady on the block. Her name is Desiree. She is sexy and also a divorcee. You can try to swoop in. Eddd. I laughed at my dad's reaction, and the turmoil inside my heart soothed a bit. After the cruise, I took a bus home with stuff I bought at the farmer's market. I put them into the fridge after I got home. After having a simple lunch, I checked the garage for tools to clean up the house. Insert 2009 greatest music here. Ladder. Check. Lawnmower. Check. Gloves. Check. I removed the ladder and cleaned up the rain drain near the roof. I noticed that a busybody blonde lady was watching me from afar, but I ignored her, thinking she was some Karen walking around the street. Ew. I found a bird carcass in the drain along with a nest. I quickly cleaned up the gutter and tied up all the garbage in a black plastic bag. Why didn't I get a cleaning gotcha last night? My work will be done so much faster with it. I whined as I did my job. My rate of cleaning was fast for a teenager. However, I still needed more. After scouring the front lawn for solid objects, I went to the garage to start the lawnmower. However, after pulling the startup rope a few times, I found the lawnmower was totally broken. Foo, I guess being unused for two years broke it. Suddenly, my instinct was telling me to open up the lawnmower. A-H-H. Special talent. Come forth. I said and cringed at myself after. I took out my dad's tool and started studying the lawnmower's mechanism. I see. The rotor is blocked. I muttered with oil stains on my glove. After a few adjustments, the lawnmower finally turned on. Nice, I exclaimed and started to mow the grass on the front lawn and the backyard. The backyard was a little bigger, so I needed extra time to do so. The tall grass there was dying as the sprinklers were broken. There were a few flower pots near the door, so I needed to clean up all that. I took out my dad's spanner and fixed the sprinkler mechanism on the front lawn quite efficiently. It'll take my dad $500 to fix it by a professional. I will only charge him half price later. After cleaning it all up, it's already time for dinner. I saw the sky darken, but the unfinished job put a bad taste in my mouth. The house looks so much better now, however, it still needs a lot more fixing. There's some ivy growing on the side of the house that really bothered me. It would take me another two hours to clean it up if I started, and I was seriously contemplating it. Okay, that's enough for today. Suddenly, a familiar voice sounded behind me, making me feel deja vu with yesterday's encounter with Phil. But this time, the voice was that of a woman. I turned and saw Claire hugging her sweater while holding a Tupperware in her left hand. Claire. I blurted out unconsciously. Mrs. Dunphy, Claire said sternly. I gulped and saw Luke and Phil waving at me from afar, trying to catch up with Claire. Why are you here? I asked. I see you cleaning up your lawn this afternoon, so I don't want to bother you. But you keep continuing until evening, and it's making me a bit worried. Claire said. Hey, Ed. Phil greeted as he and Luke walked over. Dude, you're crazy. Everyone in the neighborhood is watching. Some even bet when you're going to stop cleaning dash Luke shared, but Claire hurriedly closed his mouth with her palm. I see, I replied, unbothered by the gawking of my neighbors. The house was in a total wreck and people's interest was aroused when I started cleaning it. Ed, have you eaten dinner yet? Do you want to have dinner with us? Phil offered. No I was thinking of cooking something simple for tonight. Maybe an Alfredo. I replied. I already bought the ingredients to cook it in the market today. Sweetie. You're pushing yourself too hard. Wait, is that? Claire said anxiously, and she suddenly grabbed my arm. Sweetie, you're bleeding, and you don't even notice it. I noticed it, I replied. Claire was flabbergasted and asked, so why don't you stop and clean it up? It's just a small nick. The bleeding had already stopped. I replied casually. That's, seemed to be a mistake as it pushed Claire into a full-blown angry mom mode. Despite her objections, Phil quickly calmed her down and pushed her to the side. Edward, you need some rest. Go inside and take a bath. I'll wait for you at my house. Phil said calmly while smiling. It's really okay, P. Mr. Dunphy. I just want to lie down after this. Like you said, I need rest. I suddenly realized that I'm exhausted. I avoided the awkward dinner scene splendidly. No. Claire suddenly interjected. Phil. Go to our house to get the medical kit. I will cook for him here if he doesn't want to come. Phil chuckled before he saw Claire's look of determination. 
Wait, you're serious. Yes, Phil, I am serious. Go, Claire ordered. Phil and Luke flinched and ran toward their house hurriedly, leaving me alone with Claire. And you, young man. Claire turned her angry eyes at me. I gulped and waited for the order. Go and take a bath, Claire said sternly. Yes, ma'am. I saluted her and ran inside my house. Claire's commentary. She sat on the sofa, silent for a while as she hesitated to share. That kid, Edward, and I, was similar. Claire said with glassy eyes. Both of us grew up in a chaotic household that drives me almost crazy when I see things aren't in order. And now, I see that he is going through the same thing I did. The scene cuts to Claire preparing a fettuccine Alfredo for Edward as he has all the ingredients in the fridge. Even watching Edward arranging his stuff together caused Claire to choke up. Claire, and there is no way I will let him be the new me. I wonder if I can do something about it. Luke and Phil commentary. Luke, mom really wants Edward to eat her cooking. Phil, I know, right? Laugh. Chapter 6, Chapter 6, First Day of School, Again. That was, the weirdest dinner of my life, I muttered as I recollected the events of last night. Claire was staring at me as I ate. I almost choked a few times because of her. She didn't stay long, though, as she needed to return to her family for dinner. I thanked her for her kindness and said I would bring something to her house as thanks later. Claire denied the gratitude, but Phil accepted it gladly and whispered something I couldn't hear to Claire. Flashback. Ed, you play guitar. Phil asked excitedly as he saw my electric guitar in the living room. Yeah, I am good with most instruments but the best at guitar. I bragged. Really? Can you show us? Luke asked innocently. Even Phil was looking forward to it. I can, but you must return to your house, right? I don't think Claire will like it if you're late. I said after thinking for a few seconds. Oh shoot. You know what? Luke and I will come to watch you play another day. Is that okay? Phil asked. Sure. I am not free tomorrow as I'm going shopping. Maybe Tuesday. I said. I can't. Tuesday, I play soccer. Why don't my dad and I come next Friday? Luke said and turned to look at his dad. That'll work. See you, Friday Ed. Also, don't clean in the middle of the night. Phil teased and chuckled before he turned serious. I'm serious. If Claire catches you. He didn't continue, but I understood what he was saying. Flashback ends. Right now, I'm cycling to school as I always did. It'll take me 20 minutes to get to school cycling by myself. I only carried a light bag with barely anything inside, as most of my school's stuff was inside its locker. After applying deodorant and eating a big breakfast of pancakes and lats, I asked for my father's credit card, which he gladly granted me. I also billed him for the sprinkler and lawnmower repairs, which dropped his jaw. Ed ed ed. You don't even bring your homework home. I clicked my tongue at the previous me as I stopped my bike at a red traffic light. And now, I am the one who will be in trouble for it. As the light turned green, I continued cycling again. This is my last year of junior high. I'm supposed to enter high school after the summer, but Edward's previous performance in school could have been better. If this continues, I will have to attend summer school to make up for my grades. I shuddered at that thought. Please don't. There is no way I could tolerate being in the same class as the problematic 14-year-olds for an entire summer. Arg, I need to do an assignment presentation today. I screamed in frustration while scratching the back of my head. But then I realized I'd ruined my Zac Efron high school musical hair. Last day with this style. I will get a haircut after this when Kem and Mitch pick me up. Although the hair was refined in 2009, I couldn't bring myself to love the haircut. Imagine an adult with that hair, why do I imagine Phil? I could try to do the assignment at home, but I don't know the topics I could choose for my assignments. All of it was inside the locker. Edward didn't even glance at the paper before he went home. Otherwise, I could have done it based on memories alone. Added to my luck, I have the science subject as my first class today with the stern Mrs. Henderson. I already served my time in school. Why do I need to suffer again? I muttered sadly. Hmm, it is what it is. Finally, the school was in sight. After locking my bike in the bike rack, I hastened to the locker and took out my stuff. Ring. The homeroom bell rang before I could glance at my assignment docket. A-H-H damn. I cursed and quickly walked to my science class for today. I sat at my usual spot, where an anime protagonist would sit. First desk from behind, next to the windows where I could see the sky. It is the ideal place to sleep. Good job, Edward. I thought as I took my seat under the watchful gaze of the teacher. Technically I was on time, but her look was vicious regardless. The teacher was dressed in a white shirt, long skirt, and high waist. She wore a half-frame glass and wore her hair in a bun. She's stunning for a woman in her 40s. I turned my focus on the assignment docket after I sat down. There were a few topics listed inside the paper that I could choose for my assignment. Hmm. Inertia. Newton's third law of motion. Parallel circuits. As I was reading the assignment details, I was suddenly distracted by the teacher's shout. Mr. Newgate. I'd been calling you for a while. Please focus inside the classroom. The MILF Mrs. Henderson said. Sorry, I replied and acted like I was focusing on the classroom. However, I noticed that a lot of the students there were looking at me. What are you waiting for, Mr. Newgate? It's time for your presentation. Mrs. Henderson said in an icy voice. A-H-H, fuck my life. I cursed under my breath. Come on. Think. Think. 
As I stood up from my seat to walk toward the front of the class, I used extreme effort to rack my brain about the matter. My eyes darted around the science classroom, and I took in every single detail that could help me save my life. Hurry up, Edward. We don't get all day. A random shout from another problematic student caused me to turn toward him. He got a potato inside his chubby hands, I wonder what was that for. As I looked at the boy, I saw a familiar face inside the classroom. Why is Alex here? I scrunched my eyebrow as I thought about it. She wore a headband today instead of tying her hair and a simple purple shirt. I didn't know then that Alex was Mrs. Henderson's favorite student, and she sometimes lets her sit inside the advanced classes to watch the course. As the teacher's pet, Alex had some privileges that her other classmates didn't. She was there the week before too, but the previous Edward went straight to sleep as he got to class, so he didn't notice, nor did he care. With her here, my mind suddenly birthed a grand scheme that would help me pass this class brilliantly. All right, you snotty little brats. I said as I started my presentation today. The greeting aroused anger from the kids in the classroom and a scolding from Mrs. Henderson, but I didn't care. The more agitated they are, the better. For my presentation today, I'm going to show you a magic trick using three simple items. Mr. Newgate. Mrs. Henderson exclaimed in exasperation. She thought I'll be messing around in the classroom and failed yet another one of her assignments. She already labeled me as a summer class attendee inside her heart, but I will continue my presentation. As it would be illegal for me to bring a knife to school, I would like to ask Mrs. Henderson for permission to use a knife and a mallet in my presentation. Mrs. Henderson shook her head slightly before she agreed. Sure. I also need a potato. Can anyone provide me with one? I said and gazed maliciously at the kid who had heckled me before. The chubby kid with a flat top was startled as I stared at his potato. Seriously, why did he bring a raw potato here? Did he eat them raw? I thought. And no, this is mine. Mr. Jacob, please cooperate, I said, mimicking Mrs. Henderson's tone, earning another laugh from the kids there. Finally, I received my three items for the presentation. You see, in my hand, there is an ordinary knife, an ordinary mallet, and, a purple potato. The kids were all focusing intently on what I was going to do. Then, I stabbed the potato with the knife directly at the center. N-O-O-O. Jacob screamed in despair, but I shushed him. The tip of the knife was inside the potato, barely deep enough to hold the potato in the air. What will happen when I hit the back of the knife while it sticks to the potato in the air? I asked the audience. The class was silent, so I turned to Alex. That beauty over there with the glasses? What do you think? I said, pointing at Alex. She was taken aback and knocked her pencil case on the floor, drawing everyone's attention. Ah, it will fall. Alex said without thinking much. Her face blushed red as she was complimented suddenly. Alex said it will fall. So, let's see what will happen. I said and knocked the back of the knife with the mallet. To everyone's surprise, the potato moved higher up into the blade as I hit the knife with the hammer. Even the hopeless Mrs. Henderson showed curiosity about my presentation now. How? Jacob yelled, demanding the answer. But I would only tell him so slowly, as I wasn't sure what this presentation entailed precisely. Can anyone tell me what I was trying to demonstrate here? I asked no, I kept the audience intrigued by the presentation by involving them with the experiment. The class was silent yet again, so I turned to the beauty for an answer. You're, trying to demonstrate. Newton's law of motion. Alex replied, still blushing but having regained her focus. Yup, that's right. My demonstration showed that an object in inertia or rest that didn't have time to move would stay in rest unless given time to react. The potato was resting before I knocked the knife with the mallet. But as it didn't have time to react, it showed that the potato was moving upward into the knife. That was wrong. The one that did move was the knife, wasn't the potato. Proving Newton's law of motion. I asked the class again. However, this time, everyone could answer the question. First law. That's right, you brats. Newton's first law, an object at rest remains at rest, or if in motion, remains at a constant velocity unless acted on by a net external force. Do you understand it now? I asked again. This time, all the students there answered me meekly as if I were the teacher. All together, yes. Okay. Call me Mr. Newgate from now on. I added. Mrs. Henderson walked to the front, causing the class to fall into silence again. Good job Mr. Newgate. She said with narrowed eyes and an insincere tone, causing me to gulp my saliva in fear. I assume you already brought your report on your presentation to submit today. Mrs. Henderson asked in a cold tone. A-H-H. I didn't know about the report. For your presentation, I will give you an A for the assignment if you submit the report before the day ends. Otherwise, you'll fail. Do you have anything else to say? No, ma'am. Good. Go sit down. Mrs. Henderson said and took back control of the class. I obediently sat down at the back and took out the assignment paper to read it correctly. Okay. The TikTok video I watched before saved me from the presentation. But now, I need to know how to do the report. Damn it, Ed. At least focus on how to do it. I can easily fill in the blanks later. I muttered whisperingly. After getting the additional IQ stat from the gotcha, I could remember my memories from my past life easier now. I also need to only flip the book a few times to understand a topic I'm reading. I didn't realize that Alex glanced at me a few times as I rubbed my head in frustration. He is, smart. Alex muttered to herself. No, that, must be a fluke. 
I turned my head around to search for clues around the class when I saw Alex looking at me. I smiled and waved at her, causing her to quickly turn her head to the front of the course. The day continues, and it's time for a break between classes. Before I left for lunch, I told the heartbroken Jacob that I would bring him a potato the next day because I witnessed how distraught he was when he watched his closest buddy being mercilessly stabbed, by me. Teenagers is such a weird state for us to go through. I thought secretly. Hey, Newgate. Suddenly, an angry voice called out to me as I comforted Jacob. Hey, Alex, I said casually as I turned to face the caller. Don't hey Alex me. Why are you trying to embarrass me earlier? Alex asked angrily. When did I embarrass you? I titled my head in confusion. Don't play dumb, you you called me pretty in front of the class. Alex stammered. I didn't call you pretty, though. I called you beautiful. I said with a smile. That is the same thing. Alex said in frustration. I laughed and said, because I think that's true. That's it, beautiful. Jacob, who heard the conversation, widened his eyes, had his jaw dropped, and took notes inside his mind on how to talk to girls. Alex blushed and ran away in embarrassment. It's not like I was coming on to her. She was too young, for God's sake. But it's always fun to tease girls, especially the uptight ones. Okay, Jacob. I'll bring it to you tomorrow. I turned my attention back to Jacob as Alex turned a corner and disappeared from sight. Dude, I don't care about the potato anymore. Can you teach me that? Jacob asked. Sorry. Trade secret. Jacob was silent as he racked his brain on how to tempt me. I have done my report, do you want me to show you how to dash? He stopped as I suddenly wrapped my hand over his neck. Jacob was tall and pretty big, more than 179 centimeters at 14 years old. His body bent to the side as I wrapped my hands around him. So, you want to know how to talk to girls? Don't worry. You're now in the hands of a master. First, I taught him some basic things as we walked to the next class together. Mrs. Ice Quee Henderson. I almost blurted out as I saw Mrs. Henderson two hours after her class. I just finished math's class, which was a piece of cake even in my previous life. There was a pop quiz in the class, but I finished it early with all the questions right. Honestly, it was just 8th grade level. I would be embarrassed if I struggled with that. Mr. Newgate. Have you finished your report? The teacher asked, not looking up from marking the other students' assignments. Yup. I'm sorry for the hand-drawn figure, though. I had to draw it alone in a limited amount of time. I said as I placed my three-page report on her desk. The teacher flipped through the pages and found out that the information was neatly written and fulfilled all of the requirements she wanted. Did you ask someone else to write this for you? She said, a bit skeptical. No. All me. It's good, Mr. Newgate. You've worked hard. The teacher flashed a sincere smile as she saw the notable changes in her problematic student. His barely negligible writing also changed to be more pleasing to the eyes. I felt awkward as she fell silent, so I asked flirtatiously, So, is there a Mr. Henderson? Get out. She ordered in a cold tone. I was then chased away by the homeroom teacher. I finished all my classes in the afternoon and biked home for my shopping trip. Kem arrived with his friend Pepper who drove a Mercedes convertible to pick me up in front of the Dunphy's house. There is no way I will let the snarkiest group of people in the world know my house's condition before I fix its appearance entirely. Whistles, nice ride. Thanks. I saw Brittany with the same car, so I should have one too, as I am classier than her. Pepper said. Did you tell your father that you're going out today? He was a bit concerned as I am still a minor. Yes. He already gives me his permission, and he knows Mitchell, so it wasn't hard. He didn't say he knew who I was. Kem pretended to be sad. He didn't mind since he was too excited about the possibility of shopping today. No. He met you just once. Why would he mention you? I teased. Maybe because I'm unforgettable, Kem said with a giggle. Pepper was one of the show's characters that I liked despite being a side character. His clothes, his car, all of it was stylish. He wore a brown suit today with a polka dot necktie that somehow fits into his attire. I got to admit Pepper is the most well-dressed person I've known here, not that I met with many people. I didn't think I could meet him here today, but Kem wanted to bring Pepper to show me true fashion. It will be hard for him as I am barely controlling myself to point out the flaws in his outfits today. After the initial introduction, I asked. Where's Mitchell? Oh, he is still at work. There is still an hour before he gets off, so we will go shopping first while we wait for him. Kem replied, still with his theatrical hand gestures. If we have time to spare, can I get a haircut first? I asked. You should spare me seeing you with that haircut before we meet. Then, I will like you more. Pepper snarked. Really? I waited for a haircut because I didn't trust other people's opinions on what style I should get. They need to be more stylish. My mind changed after meeting you today Pepper. Kid. I know I like you for a reason. Pepper smiled brightly and drove me to the top California salon to get a haircut. Don't worry about the price. I will pay for it as long as you get rid of the thing you called a haircut on your head. Pepper offered. So that's how I got a $500 haircut for free. Chapter 7, Chapter 7, Shopping. A slash N, last for today three more tomorrow. Dunphy's house. Haley walked to the kitchen counter where Alex was sitting after returning from school. So, I heard a boy confessed his love to you in class today. From afar, Luke made some smooching sounds. No, he's not. Alex replied defensively, making Claire turn her attention to the talk. 
She walked to the kitchen while holding a basket full of laundry in her hands. Alex, is that true? No, don't listen to her. Alex yelled. He was just messing with me. I heard he ignored the teacher and told Alex that he loves her right in the middle of a presentation. My friend has a brother in the school and told me all about it. Haley adds, pouring oil into the flames she's grilling her sister on. Edward's scandalous action had spread through the school's gossiping squad and reached even the elementary and high schoolers in the town. It was a time before social media took over people's lives, so gossip spread easily. Who is he? Haley demanded to know. The gossip was so twisted that the boy's name was already lost when it passed through the third person. I'm not talking to you. Alex picked up all of her books and ran away to get to her bedroom. Alex. We're going shopping oh, she's gone. Claire yelled from afar, but Alex slammed the door when she got into her room, letting her know the answer to her question before she could even ask it. She wanted to ask Haley more about the details, but Haley, as usual, had already gotten lost on her phone. Haley needed a ride to the mall to meet her friends there, so she had to wait for Claire to finish her work. Haley suddenly read a vital text, widened her eyes, and ran toward Alex in their room. You cannot date that guy. He's a jerk. I may need to get in the middle of that, Claire muttered while picking up the landline phone. Phil, where are you? In his car, Phil replied. What? We are going to the mall, right? His car had already pulled up to the mall parking lot. Yeah. So, where are you? I'd been waiting for you to come back for a while now, Claire said, still holding the laundry basket in one hand. Wait. I thought you were meeting me there? I am already here, Phil said nervously. Phil. Seriously. Claire scolded in anger. I really thought we were meeting here. Phil defended himself anxiously. All right. I'll bring, Luke will go with me and go there in the minivan. Haley, we're going. Claire shouted to her daughter and hung up the call. Alex, don't open the door for strangers. From afar, Alex replied, what am I, Luke and Haley? Just go. Claire nodded and took the key to the minivan before driving off with her family. Shopping mall. Edward POV. ZRRKKK the dressing room curtain was pulled, and I walked out with a new pair of clothes I was testing on. My new haircut was a textured fringe haircut with a fade on the side. The hairstylist was so satisfied with the work that he took my picture and put me on the walls of his saloon. Hmm, I look good. I said as I saw my reflection in the full body mirror. A checkered shirt with a green and black pattern, a simple white t-shirt on the inside, and brown cocky pants. My shoes were black converse, so it fits with every teenager's daily outfits. This is the best I could do with limited options. I could only spend some of my dad's money on outfits when he's struggling financially. I need to consider his situation too. That looked good, but are you sure you don't want to try a suit? Pepper asked. Well, the important thing is to wear it confidently, Kim added beside Pepper. Also, I love you. Don't second guess your style. You don't even need our opinion. I wish I had your confidence at my age. Can you be more of a kiss ass? Pepper sniped at Cam. What? Cam asked in confusion. You're only buttering him up so that he'll say nice things for you later, Pepper said as he saw through Cam clearly. Don't worry, Cam. Your style is pretty nice today. Your outfit only suc not that good yesterday. You want to say suck, don't you? I'll let you know, my outfits are based on the latest issues of this month's Vanity Fair. So, who has bad taste now? I replied casually. You. Kem was a bit stunned while Pepper chuckled at him. BTW, do you know where I can get high quality fabrics for cheap? I asked as I planned to create my own outfits from now on. Well, our friend Long Inus ran a boutique. I'll ask him for you. But why do you ask? Kem responded. Are you thinking of making your own outfits? I got to warn you. It's not that easy. Pepper added. He snarked. It's not like Britney after a few drinks. Kem giggled, and I chuckled a bit. After buying a few outfits, I asked, so, where's Mitchell? Well, he's supposed to be here by now, Kem said in concern as he turned to look around the mall. I'll call him. He walked a few steps from the group for a personal conversation, leaving me alone with Pepper Saltzman. So Edward Dash. Ed, is fine. We're friends, right? Pepper beamed with a smile and replied, yes. We're friends, I guess. So, Ed, do you, have any interest you're currently into? Sorry, it's the longest time I'd ever talked with a high school boy, even in my teenage years. He's terrible at the straight talk, but I'll let the matter go, as he has helped me a lot today. I play many instruments and even wrote a few songs. I'll play it to you once to pay you back for the haircut. Once? Your songs must be expansive. Pepper snarked unconsciously. You have no idea, I muttered with a grin. Pepper smiled as if challenging me about the matter. I don't know why, but Edward had written songs similar to the ones I'd heard in my past life. It made me wonder if the original soul was a trans migrator too, or if my existence had come here even earlier than I regained my memories. There weren't any feelings of discomfort at all with the two memories merging with each other or me getting into Edward's life. I am inquisitive about this. Maybe I can write a letter to Afterlife Corp to get an answer in the next lottery. Ed come back. Pepper said while snapping his fingers in front of my face. Yeah, what? I said, snapping out of my deep thoughts. We lost you there, Ed. What are you thinking about so deeply? Kem said, already returning from his call. Nah. Just thinking about what song I'm going to play for you guys after. Wait. You're serious about that? Pepper said. Kem got excited. Well. I played drums, and I was a music teacher before this. 
I can give you some tips for your song. Okay, deal. I replied. Our friends Stephen and Stefan ran a cafe on the lower floor. It usually has a live music performance every Tuesday night, but I think there's equipment there. You can show us your song in the cafe. Pepper suggested. Of course. You don't have to do it if you don't want to. I want to, I said decisively. There's not a lot of adults who take a second look at me, especially bringing me around to play. You got the privilege to be my first fan because of that. Ho 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 ho. Fan ha. You're really confident about this? Let's go. Pepper said. Wait. Mitchell is parking the car. Let's wait for him before we go there. Kem said. Mitchell came huffing his breath a few minutes later. I'm here. I'm here. Mitchell, how could you? I said in fake sadness. Pepper and Cam almost giggled as they were the ones who planned this. I'm really sorry. I'll show you. Oh, you're already bought the pants. Mitchell saw the pants I was wearing now. I even posed for him to let him look at it better. I'm sorry. I need to finish a lot of work as we're going to. A holiday? Wait. You already know. To Vietnam this Wednesday. I'll need to finish it. Otherwise, my boss will chew my head off. Mitchell explained. It's okay. Pepper had much more style than you anyway. I said. Mitchell's mouth opened a bit. His heart was broken by that statement. Stop stating the obvious, Ed. Let's go. I'll get us the best seat in the house too. You'll only have fun when you're friends with Pepper Saltzman. Pepper took the lead, and we walked to the cafe. Mitchell and Cameron commentary. Cam, oh my god. I didn't expect hanging out with a 14-year-old boy would be so fun. Edward is such an old soul. He can dash. Mitchell, well, don't make it a habit. Or else the only place you'll make new friends is behind bars. Kem was silenced by the statement. So, he tried to start again. A 14. Don't. Mitchell stopped him immediately. Well, he's great. Kem said. It's kind of sad that he's always alone. Mitchell turned to Kem, showing some interest. How did you know about this? Well, I texted Haley. And she told me all about him. About their fight too. Mitchell said in shock, they fought. Yeah, haha. Ha. It's very teen drama-like. Kem said while giggling. Commentary ends. We reached the cafe after a while. While Pepper was talking with his friends Stephen and Stefan, Kem asked me, do you want me to hold the drums for you? I'm very good. Maybe after some practice. Not now. You'll only ruin the song now. I said. That's true, Mitchell added, his arms crossed, and he rolled his eyes at Kem's obsession to be in the spotlight. Well, just so you know, I'll be a critique if you suck at it. Kem growled. I'm so scared. I teased. I would be quaking in my boots if this was the normal me. The new Edward wanted nothing else than other people hearing his songs. In fact, he was obsessed with it. I was very fortunate to have been removed from my anxieties in this life. Now I could do things that I'd never thought I would do in my life. A slash N warning. Cringe ahead. Do remember he is still in his bad luck phase. The stage is all yours, Ed, Pepper said after returning. Stephen and Stefan waved at our group from afar, then sat at a special table just for the VIPs to watch the show. Thank you, Pepper. Make sure to record this. You won't get another experience like this later. I said confidently and walked up to the stage. I sat on the piano and tested it for a while. Once I confirmed there was nothing wrong with it, I grabbed the microphone. The cafe was half empty, mainly consisting of mothers who were thrown by their teenage daughters as they embarrassed them while shopping and teenagers who just finished school. Hello, everyone. My name's Ed. And today, I'll share two original songs I made with everyone here to thank those who spent some time with me today. The Great Pepper Saltzman, the Has Awesome Style Now Cameron Tucker, and the Don't Care About the Time Mitchell Pritchett. Kem giggled while sitting at the seat nearest to the stage with Pepper and Mitch. Mitch lowered his head in shame while Pepper had a very proud expression as he was called great. Are you recording it? Pepper asked Cam. Of course. I'll make sure to pinpoint every mistake he made after this. Kem said menacingly. Cam, Mitchell called his life partner out. He's a kid, whisper, but do that. I know. I won't discourage him. But if the song is not good, he needs to know. Kem said. Edward didn't say much after that and started pressing the key in the piano, playing a soft piano intro. Well, he is skillful. Pepper complimented. He'd played the piano growing up, so he could recognize Edward's hard work in training for the instrument. Dash 3 RD Party POV. Phil. Where were you? I'd been looking for you forever. Claire said after finally meeting with Phil after 20 minutes. Her hair was tied up in a bun with multiple strands loose. She wore a simple white, checkered t-shirt that a boy would wear and jeans. Hey, you made it. Phil said excitedly, running lightly to Claire and Luke. Sporting a blazer and simple slacks, Phil hugged Clario Hoos, carrying multiple bags in her hand from shopping alone. Where were you? Claire squinted her eyes in suspicion. I was, just, slowly, in a magic shop. Before Claire could nag, she heard a voice coming from the cafe nearby. Sounds from afar. Cameron Tucker, and the don't care about the time Mitchell Pritchett. Mitch and Kim are here. Phil asked. Let's take a look. Luke ran toward the cafe, Phil following him from behind right after. Phil? Luke? Claire widened her eyes in disbelief and walked toward the cafe too reluctantly. They could only stay there for a short time as Alex was alone at home now. Even though Claire was sure that Alex wouldn't even move from her desk by the time she got home, she still couldn't bear leaving her alone in the house, even for a few hours. Lucas Graham seven years. Sitting on the piano, Edward started to sing. 
At once, I was seven years old, my mama told me, go make yourself some friends, or you'll be lonely. Once, I was seven years old. It's good. Kim complimented. The lyrics are a bit childish, though. But I guess he can't help it being a teenager and didn't have much life experience dash. Pepper, s-h-h-h-h, just listen. Pepper scolded. Ed, it was a big big world, but we thought we were bigger. Pushing each other to the limits, we were learning quicker. By eleven, smoking herbs and drinking burning liquor. Never rich, so we were out to make that steady figure. He did what? Claire almost yelled as she heard and saw Edward playing on the stage. Phil quickly closed her mouth from behind like a kidnapper and sat her down on the table nearby. Edward once, I was 11 years old, my daddy told me, go get yourself a wife, or you'll be lonely. Once, I was 11 years old. I always had that dream like my daddy before me. So, I started writing songs, and I started writing stories. Something about the glory just always seemed to bore me. Cause only those I really love will ever really know me. The audience became hooked by the singing, even the critical ex-music teacher, Cameron. Once, I was 20 years old, my story got told. Before the morning sun, when life was lonely. Once, I was 20 years old. I only see my goals. I don't believe in failure. Cause I know the smallest voices, they can make it major. I got my boys with me, at least those in favor. And if we don't meet before I leave, I hope I'll see you later. Once, I was 20 years old, my story got told. I was writing about everything I saw before me. Once, I was 20 years old. He's 14, right? Pepper asked in a whisper. Yes, Cameron replied, his expression both in disbelief and excitement as if he found the new Justin in this era. Mitchell leaned forward as he immersed himself in the song. Ed, soon, we'll be 30 years old, and our songs have been sold. We've traveled around the world, and we're still roaming. Soon, we'll be 30 years old. I'm still learning about life. My woman brought children for me, so I can sing them all my songs and tell them stories. Phil suddenly realized it. It's, his dream. Claire turned to Phil and then looked back at Edward, opening her ears to understand the lyric better. Cameron couldn't help but comment, his beat becomes slower at age 30, signaling that his life is slowed down from his 20s. It's brilliant. Ed most of my boys are with me. Some are still out seeking glory. And some I had to leave behind, my brother. I'm still sorry. Soon, I'll be 60 years old. My daddy got 61. Remember life, and then your life becomes a better one. Pepper said, so, he only has one more year to live. Like his dad. He couldn't help but take out his handkerchief to wipe his tears. Ed I made the man so happy when I wrote a letter once. I hope my children come and visit once or twice a month. Phil looked at Luke, tears in his eyes. He thought about his dad in Florida. Although he just called his dad this morning, he's really missing him now. Ed, soon, I'll be 60 years old. Will I think the world is cold? Or will I have a lot of children who can warm me? Soon, I'll be 60 years old. Most of the audience thought in their mind. What will the future hold for them? Ed, soon, I'll be 60 years old. Will I think the world is cold? Or will I have a lot of children who can hold me? Soon, I'll be 60 years old. Piano. Once, I was 7 years old, my mama told me go make yourself some friends, or you'll be lonely. Once, I was 7 years old. Once, I was 7 years old. Song ends. Edward POV. I finally reached the end of the song. However, the cafe was in total silence afterward. I turned to the crowd with beats of sweat on my forehead. I had sung the song with all my efforts like the previous kid would have wanted. So, how is it? I used the microphone to ask while wiping off my sweats. The crowd was eerily silent after my question. Suddenly, they cheered and applauded. From afar, Phil shouted, way to go, Edward. Cameron ran to the stage and hugged the artist. Oh my gosh, that's such a beautiful song. Yeah, yeah, keep it in your pants. I still have another song to perform. I said dismissively. Oh, right. Kim said in realization and released me immediately. I stood up from the piano seat and took a guitar this time. The previous song is called Seven Years. The crowd applauded again after hearing the name of the song. They couldn't wait to listen to another, as I promised them two pieces today. I didn't realize it, but the crowd inside the cafe had doubled. Some of the customers were standing to hear me singing. Even a certain doe-eyed teenage girl hitched a ride with her mom to the mall. Chapter 8, Chapter 8, When Is the Pilot Coming? Pepper Saltman, the song is captivating, novel, and on the brink of genius. Just say genius. He is a genius. Mitchell corrected. He changed his impression of Edward and didn't hold a grudge anymore for belittling his fashion sense now. The moniker before Edward started to sing. The nuance, the way he lost himself in the music, the passion, the kid is a born singer. Kem added. I told you before, I will play two songs today, I said as I looked at the crowd. The next song was written by me when I fell down and lost someone important. I hope you'll like it. I said. I saw Phil, Claire, and Luke sitting in a booth near the entrance, far away from Mitchell and Cam's position. I waved at Phil, and he, in turn, excitedly waved back with Luke. As Mitch and Cam's table was nearby, I whispered to them. Mitch, your sister and brother-in-law are here. Really? Mitchell turned and saw the Dunphys sitting nearby. Cam waved his hand at the Dunphys excitedly at them and mouthed he would be there later. Oh, this is awesome. Phil muttered as he stopped waving his hands. A server comes to the table to take their order. 
Even the waiter had stopped what he was doing before when the song was playing. Luckily for him, his bosses were inside the VIP booth, drying their tears with a handkerchief. Wait, we're not staying. Claire tried to get up, but Phil took the menu and said, Bring me coffee, black and iced chocolate for Luke, and Claire, you want some tea? Phil. Claire said in disbelief. Alex is alone. She whispered angrily. Don't worry, Alex is going to be fine. Phil said. What else is she going to do besides reading books? Throw a dork party. Luke added and laughed together with philosophy dork party, that's hilarious, Phil muttered. Claire hesitated in her awkward position of standing up and sitting down before she decided to sit. One more song. That's it. Claire said. Besides, even she was curious about the song. The kitchen is backed up, so it may take a while for your order to come out. Is that okay? The waiter asked. Yeah, sounds fine, Phil replied and returned the menu to the waiter. Claire looked astonished and wasn't sure how to react seeing Phil's action. He's starting, Luke said. Song, Amnesia by 5 Seconds of Summer. Edward I drove by all the places we used to hang out, getting wasted. I thought about our last kiss, how it felt, the way you tasted. And even though your friends tell me you're doing fine. Are you somewhere feeling lonely, even though he's right beside you? Claire commented, that's it. We will need to have a talk with him later. Phil looked helplessly at Edward, who dug his hole even deeper. Edward when he says those words that hurt you, do you read the ones I wrote you? Sometimes I start to wonder, was it just a lie? If what we had was real, how could you be fine? Cause I'm not fine at all. Who is he singing this for? I couldn't help but think there's something more to the lyrics. Pepper commented. I don't know, but you can feel the pain coming out from his voice. Cameron snobbishly said. Mitchell rolled his eyes and then couldn't wonder what had happened to Edward. Ed, I remember the day you told me you were leaving. I remember the makeup running down your face. And the dreams you left behind, you didn't need them. Like every single wish we ever made. Claire widened her eyes and slapped Phil's shoulder repeatedly. Phil. It's about his mother. I wish that I could wake up with amnesia. And forget about the stupid little things. Like the way it felt to fall asleep next to you. And the memories I never can escape. Cause I'm not fine at all. Oh my god, he's reaching out again. Phil said and almost stormed to the stage to give Edward a hug. Claire barely managed to hold Phil back by pulling his clothes, causing him to be choked by them. The song continued amidst the myriad of reactions from the people there. Even Haley, standing near the club entrance, couldn't help but feel sorry for Edward. He's still, a jerk, right? Haley thought. Ed, if today I woke up with you right beside me, like all of this was just some twisted dream, I'd hold you closer than I ever did before, and you'd never slip away, and you'd never hear me say. Haley placed her hand above her chest and her eyes shook as she heard Edward's change in tone. She became lost in the music, and didn't even hear what her friend beside her was saying. No matter how hard her friends try, they couldn't snap her away from her mesmerized state. She didn't hear any other sound other than Ed's playing, and she'd hoped the moment would never end. I remember the day you told me you were leaving. I remember the makeup running down your face. And the dreams you left behind, you didn't need them. Like every single wish we ever made. I wish that I could wake up with amnesia, and forget about the stupid little things. Like the way it felt to fall asleep next to you, and the memories I never can escape. Cause I'm not fine at all. No, I'm really not fine at all. Tell me this is just a dream. Cause I'm really not fine at all. Song ends. Mitch and Kim lost their smile and they looked toward each other almost instinctively. Edward didn't know then how his choice of songs would have impacted his life. When he did, he would only have a wry smile on his face. In the VIP booth. It's a full house, Stefan, Stephen said excitedly as he shook the arm of his life partner. We should thank Pepper for bringing in the talent. We haven't filled a place like this in forever. Maybe we should do more bands rather than just jazz music. Stefan said. We should give him a payment like the other artist, Stephen said excitedly. But, he's 14. We can't give him too much. Stefan said slyly. Otherwise, he won't create more, new songs, to be played here. Edward POV. I bowed at the crowd amidst the thundering applause and walked down the stage to my table. Excellent, Edward. Do you want some water? Your throat must be parched. Pepper said and handed me a bottle of mountain stream water he pulled out of nowhere. Thanks. I grabbed the bottle and took a big gulp before sitting down. So, what do you think? I asked. It was great. Do you really write the songs yourself? Pepper answered. I love how you play with the melody and emotions while you sing. You're like a professional. Kim replied. I feel the same way too. Especially. The lyrics for the songs, seven years. How did you come up with that stuff? I don't normally choke up while hearing a song, but the song manages to do that for me. Yeah. I wrote it myself. I dash before I could continue. Phil grabbed my shoulder from behind. Edward, the songs are awesome. Phil complimented excitedly. Claire walked behind Phil, her face full of contemplation. Should I address his mommy issues first? Or alcohol abuse? Claire thought. I looked at the time, and it was almost 5 o'clock. I think we should go back now. My dad usually gets back at 5.30. Although I want to stay longer, I am just a 14-year-old kid. I can give you a ride home if you want. Phil offered. That'll be great. No, don't. Haley suddenly interjected from behind the Dunphys. Haley, when did you come here? Claire asked in confusion. Haley had ditched her friends and ran to her family in a feat rarer than a volcano explosion after hearing the song. 
Now she wanted to go home and stop thinking about it. Don't give him a ride. I'm riding home with you. Can we go back now? Haley asked her dad. I'm sorry. Am I missing something here? Kim asked as he could sense the tension between Haley and Edward. Well, we kinda had a fight before this. I confessed while scratching my left cheek. What? Phil looked at Haley and me, and then settled his gaze on Haley. What did you fight about? Phil asked. I don't want to talk about it. Just know he's a jerk? Don't be so friendly with my family, you creep. Haley said. Haley. Claire widened her eyes in surprise as she saw her daughter's unruly behavior. It's okay, Clay Mrs. Dunphy. I was a jerk to her before. I understand that she couldn't stand me. I said calmly. Haley was stunned, and so did the rest of the group there. Oh, drama. This is what I live for. Pepper muttered whisperingly. I know, right. Mitchell agreed with Pepper. Can you explain from the start? What happened? Phil asked. He then turned to Haley. I don't think he is a bad guy. Let's try to get to the bottom of this. What exactly happened? He came to audition for Dylan's band. They didn't let him in, and then he cursed out everyone there while destroying Brian's garage. Haley said, Ed, what happened? Tell me your side of the story. Kim asked. I sighed, and I explained the whole situation. Well, I came to the audition because of a flyer. It's for a bass guitarist in the band. I never learned bass before, so I practiced hard. Kim interjected, trying to guess the story. So, you failed in the audition, got your ego hurt, and lashed out at everyone. If I could play in the first place, that will be true, I said. Kim widened his eyes and said, I'm sorry, continue. So I came to the band practice to audition. But then, a girl I will name Yoko from now on as I deleted her name from my brain instantly after the incident. She mocked me before I even played. She's dash Haley tried to interject, but Phil stopped her in his rare sternness. Let him finish, Haley. First, she mocked my clothes. Said I was homeless. I will bring the band image down. I will hurt the band's reputation. That was before I could even say hello. I continued. Mitchell suddenly placed his hand on my shoulder. It's okay. I'm okay. It doesn't bother me anymore. I said and patted his hand twice before he released it. I tried to play, but Yoko brought up how my mother had run away from my family. And she continued to be rude to me. I continued in a calm tone. Your mother, is gone. Pepper asked in shock. He now has a new understanding of the amnesia song. Yes. She decided she was a lesbian after 12 years of marriage. Run away from the family with her lover. Cut off all contact with my dad and me. Filed for divorce and disappeared forever. The gays rolled their eyes and mouthed the word lesbians without any sounds. I am still casual, but the gay group there didn't expect a simple teenage fight to bring out a more depressing topic. Honestly, they would find out soon from Claire and Phil, so I would rather they know it from me. So I cursed at her. I told her, if you don't want to listen, then why the audition? She said then they already had a bass player. Her boyfriend auditioned the day before and asked me to get lost. I knew right then that I never had a chance, to begin with, so I flipped out, I concluded the story. Haley wasn't the one I was mad at, but I may have cursed at her as she was there. I'm sorry, Haley, I said sincerely. Haley, Ed is saying he's sorry dash Phil tried to interject after Haley didn't respond to the apology. He called me 10 bucks an hour girl you can get down the street. Haley exploded at her father. Kim and Pepper giggled, and they got hit in the back by Mitch. Then, Mitch covered his mouth with his hand and laughed a bit too. To be fair, I was calling your friend that. You're just collateral damage. I explained. Inwardly, I thought, basically, I flipped out like Jake Peralta, calling everyone's mothers. See slash a Jake Peralta? Nice. Flashback cut scene. And your mother. Ed cursed at Dylan. And your mother. He cursed at Haley. And your mother's little dog. Brain interjected, you're done. No, I'm not done. You can't handle the me. Cut scene ends. That didn't make it okay. Haley shouted and ran away outside the cafe. Claire called her out and quickly pulled Luke with her to chase Haley. Philosophy settled this. I will bring Haley home. I will have a talk with her in the car. Claire said. I want my iced chocolate dash Luke tried to object, but Claire had already pulled him away. Okay, Phil replied. Edward, you already know what you did was wrong, so I wouldn't make you feel bad anymore. That's it. I asked in confusion. Pepper was called by Stephen and Stefan to the VIP booth, so he got up and walked there. Yeah, you even apologized. Now, it's up to Haley whether or not she'll take your apology. Phil explained with a smile. So I need you to work a bit hard on that when you come to our house for dinner tomorrow. I'm coming to dinner tomorrow. I said flabbergasted. Yeah, we need to settle this soon. I'd like to invite you today, but you already have plans with your dad, so. Phil said. Settle what? I don't need to beg for her forgiveness, Phil. No offense, but I don't feel like getting closer to her. I said calmly. Phil smiled as he'd expected this and replied, Well, consider it a payment for getting you to the grocery store. How about that? Hmm. Okay, fine. I said in defeat. Phil's commentary. When Edward comes by tomorrow, I will show him some of the songs I've been writing in my spare time. He laughed excitedly before he realized he was missing something. Oh yes. And fix the kid's relationship. Edward is a good boy. I'm sure he'll be a good friend, for Haley. Commentary ends. Phil, we're going to take him back, so you don't have to worry, Cameron said. Phil nodded and said, okay, 
I will go back now and try to calm Haley down. He ran after his family, pinning me to the corner and forcing me to accept the invitation to dinner at his house. I shook my head as I thought, I'd avoided the awkward situation. Why the hell did it come back? We must go now if we want to stop by Long Inu's boutique, Pepper said abruptly as he came back and stood behind Cam and Mitch. Widow we need to go there again. Mitchell asked in confusion. To pick up the fabrics Edward wants. Also, Stephen and Stefan decided to pay you for your performance and for bringing the customers in. They also asked if you could play this Thursday night again, but I declined as the time slot is near midnight, and you need to go to school. Pepper said and handed me an envelope. I didn't open it on the spot and placed it in the back of my pocket. Congratulations, Edward. Not many songwriters could say that their song had made money, but you can. Kim congratulated me sincerely. Why fabrics? Mitchell asked again. If you weren't late, you would know. I teased. Kim and Mitch commentary. Erg, that boy is making me so angry. Mitchell said in frustration. Kim laughed at him and said, he sure can hold a grudge. That's why I never went back on my promise to meet up with someone. Sure. Let's go with never. Mitchell rolled his eyes and mouthed, try couldn't. You know. Edward reminded me so much of when I was young. I am, also as musically inclined as he is. Kim said smugly. Mitchell rolled his eyes again. Music is more fun when you play it with someone else. Some friends kicked me out of the band because I was different. Some even straight away tell me that I can't play with them because I'm a homosexual, and they don't want to hear hell music coming from me. That didn't go in the direction I expected, Mitchell commented. But Edward isn't gay? He is a good dresser, but I don't think we can judge him on that. Boys nowadays aren't as bothered with traditional masculinity as in the olden days. He may just be a really good dresser. I'm not saying he is. Even I am only 60% sure that he's gay. When we're walking around earlier. Flashback. A group of models in bikinis was walking by inside the mall and inside the group's eyesight. Oh la la. I wonder if they will get cold inside the mall with such clothing. Pepper said sarcastically. Seeing things poking out from their bikinis, I think they had been cold for a long time. Kim added. Kim and Pepper chuckled and turned to look at Edward, but they were taken aback by what they saw. Edward was staring at a cute boy heading in the opposite direction of the models instead of the group of models with skimpy clothings. Kim and Mitch's commentary continues. Right? Maybe he's not all the way there, but he has some of the characteristics. Kim said. Edward commentary. Wait, I got one of these too? So cool, so anyway, I think I saw Sean Mendes at the mall today. He has a funny looking bowl cut that made me stare at him the whole time. It was freaking funny. Chapter 9, Chapter 9, nah. A slash N, I'm not sure if the chapter is edited as I can't reach my editor lol. One more chapter tonight, so gimme power stones and recommend the story to a friend. A silver Mercedes convertible cruising down the road with three people inside it. Pepper as the driver, Kim who sat next to the driver, and Edward who sat alone at the back seat. Mitchell was following Pepper's car from behind in his Prius. He needed to follow because the fabrics and outfits that Pepper bought for the kid was too much to be delivered in a single car. Pepper was too touched by the performance and he splurged on me even though I denied it repeatedly. Send me the notes and the lyrics. I will handle the copyright for you. Pepper offered casually. Peps. Seriously. This is too much. I couldn't let you do that. I widened my eyes, leaned forward to the driver's seat, and denied his goodwill again. Cameron added, Ed. You need to let him do that. Many people have videoed your song at the cafe before. If it falls into some washed up artist with bad intentions, they will steal your song. That's how good it is. So let Pepper do it. The sooner the better. The reason Cameron didn't ride with Mitchell was just for this. Pepper said while looking at the back mirror, don't worry kid. I won't charge you a thing. Just consider it my investments. Once you've risen higher than Britney, you can show that low class skank what class really is. I nodded unconsciously. Then, I got curious. What's your problem with her anyway? I did a party for her once. That booze drenched dare to look down on me. While Pepper was storytelling, Mitchell in the other car was on a call with Haley. Uncle Mitchell, why did he have to come to my house? Haley yelled from the other line. Your dad is the one who invited him. Mitchell clarified. Besides, it's only for one dinner. And Haley, he is a good boy. You need to treat him better. He reminds me of a young me and Uncle Cameron who, unbeknownst to me, a deep misunderstanding would occur when I go to Dunphy's house tomorrow night. Edward, do you have any other songs you're working on? Cameron asked inquisitively. I actually do but it's not yet complete. I replied. Shame. If you did, I can send it to get your copyright together with the other songs. Pepper added. I thought for a while before I replied, I can finish it tonight. Why don't I give you my lyrics tomorrow after school? Sure. I will send my lawyers to go pick it up. Pepper said. His lawyers were from a top law firm in Los Angeles, thanks to his rich family background. The lawyer team had been idle for a while, but still costing him money, which is why Pepper wanted them to settle the copyright for Edward's song. I will repay your generosity Pepper. I said. Don't bother kids. I want to bask in the feeling of becoming a hero to the young generation. That's enough repayment. Pepper said playfully while giggling with Cam. Cam suddenly brought up a sore topic. Who will you go to the dinner with? I frowned and replied curtly, by myself I guess. Seeing Edward staring at the road with a dissatisfied look on his face as they drove him home, Pepper and Cam smiled mischievously. 
Boy, you really hate getting forced to do things, huh? Pepper teased. You know what? It's just one dinner. You and Haley need to mend the friendship between you two. It will be hard, but it is necessary. Kem added. Why? It's not like I'm friend with her before, nor did I want to become friends with her afterwards. I replied. Kem opened his mouth a few times, but the words didn't come out. Pepper nodded at the kid's statement and said, That is true. There is absolutely no gain for you to go there, right? I feel like you're building up to something, so I'm going to wait until you finish all of your sentences first. Have you thought about how you're going to go to the cafe on Thursday night? I'm busy, Mitchell and Cameron will be in Vietnam, and your dad is working till late on Thursday night. So, Pepper smiled and asked although he already knew the answer. After I checked the amount of money I received from today's impromptu concert, I'd accepted the cafe owner's invitation despite Pepper's protest to play at the stage. I received $150 for just two songs, and they promised me an one-hour slot to play on the stage, and also $500 as payment. I will use the money to buy a laptop. Only then would I rest easy. As I was adamant about it, Pepper sighed and negotiated my time slot at 9 p.m. sharp. I also had to promise him to go back home directly after the concert and he even got the cafe owner involved in the deal so I couldn't dawdle and stay till late at the cafe. I don't think that Pepper would act this way. I guess his experience in being a dad before resurfaced today. For those who had just known Pepper, it would be impossible for them to know that he has had a family before this. His son is now a Navy SEAL, and a bit estranged with his dad. Maybe, if you kiss Dunphy's ass a little, he will drive you to the cafe instead of you taking the bus with your instrument. Kem guessed. You almost got it, Cam. Pepper said. You're wrong in one part. If he didn't have a transport to go there, and a guardian that would monitor him, Stephen and Stefan agreed with me to remove his time slot for the stage. Ugh. I groaned and rolled my eyes before turning to the road again. It was almost near my house, so I asked them to stop me a block away. This is it for me. I said as I gestured for them to stop the car. Hmm. Cameron looked around to see they were near Dunphy's house. You didn't live here. What's going on? Pepper was stunned as it was the place where he picked me up after this. Mitchell stopped his car behind Pepper's car and asked, Are we here? My house is further down. But, it's kinda in an embarrassing state. So I don't want to bring you guys there. You can come in two weeks when I finish the restoration. I said as I picked up my shopping bags from the cars. Are you sure? Kem asked, his face turned a bit sullen. I knew he felt that I was on guard against them, and that's why I didn't let them see my house, but honestly, I wouldn't mind bringing them in if the house had returned to the way it used to be. I'm sure. I said as I swayed from the weight of the bags. After saying goodbye, I walked home while the gays were waving at me. After I arrived home, I neatly arranged the fabrics that I bought by the material type and colors. I think there is a sewing machine in the garage. I will take a look at it tomorrow. I threw the dinner matter at the back of my mind as my dad returned home. I gave him back the credit card after he took off his uniform and came down to have dinner. Today I made a simple lasagna. I just bought a ready-made one in the grocery store instead of cooking it from scratch. While eating at the dinner, Ted's face looked worried and hesitant, so I asked, What's wrong dad? It's nothing. Ed, what do you think about us, moving to Wisconsin and staying with grandma and grandpa? Ted had been thinking about the matter for a while. With the cruise ship business gradually declining, his financial strain for maintaining the business made him think about quitting his dream job. I usually went there for the summer, and my grandparents took care of me very well. Why so suddenly? Did something happen at work? I asked calmly as I took the time to think about it. I don't mind it though, but don't you need to be at the sea to do your job? I honestly didn't care where I ended up. Transmigrating to the world where my favorite show came to life was great, but it's not like I wanted to be with the family all the time. If fate allows it, maybe we'll meet again in the future. I am thinking about selling the ship. Ted confessed after feeling relieved that his son didn't have much of a reaction about the prospect of moving. Hmm. I rubbed my chin together as I thought about the ship's business my dad is currently running. My current body is 14 years old now, but I was a senior programmer before and had worked with a lot of companies whether it's advertising-based or gaming-based. Ted told me about how the recession had caused his business to be near halt, and his customers had been steadily declining. He might have explained it to me because of the guilt gnawing at his heart, but it helped me to understand more about the business's situation. He used to have another captain working with him, but the guy had betrayed him and accepted a job into another cruise line. He had to cover all of the trips because of that guy as no other captain in the marina wanted to join in a sinking ship, metaphorically. We won't move right now, maybe after you finish middle school. Ted said, ending his story. If you're okay with this, I will make the plans. I am okay with it. By the way, I have a gig this Thursday that I need your permission to go to. I said. Gig? What gig? Ted asked curiously. I will be playing my songs at a cafe. I played there this afternoon, and the owner liked me so much that he gave me the most coveted time slot for the show on Thursday night. I replied casually. After talking with my dad for a while, I entered my room and flipped the textbook I brought from my locker in school. As I have history and language classes tomorrow, I need to prepare myself for the assignments. Thank God for the additional IQ. Wait, should I say thank Afterlife Corp? Hmm, doesn't matter. Thanks whoever it is. I murmured as I flipped through the history textbook and wrote a 500-word report on a topic. It took me only an hour to finish studying the materials I needed for tomorrow's class. 
I turned to the instruments near my bed, picked up something wedged inside my guitar case and finally sat on the edge of the bed while holding a stack of paper. Seven years, amnesia, toxic, grenade, monster, it will rain, Demed. if I didn't come here, you will be the most famous kid, beating out Bieber by a margin. I muttered. Most of the songs weren't complete yet, but it was easy for me to finish them as I had heard all of these songs in my previous life. By the time I finished, it was already midnight. I went to sleep for the day and desperately wished that something would come out tomorrow so that I could avoid the dinner scene. Dunphy's house. Really? I thought he didn't want us to come because he's embarrassed to be seen with us. Kem exclaimed after hearing the full story from Claire in the kitchen. Kem and Mitch decided to greet the family as they were literally in front of their house. Pepper had gone home as he needed to call his lawyers and arrange a few things for Edward. Yeah. I caught him bleeding as he tried hard to clean up his house. It looked okay now, all thanks to him. But it wasn't fully restored yet. Claire explained while holding a wine glass in her hand. She sipped the wine and held up a finger to Cam to tell him she wasn't done yet. Phil is now constantly talking about the kid, making me feel as if Phil had found a new Kenneth. The creepy kid who always stares at you as he follows Phil around. Mitchell interjected. Edward isn't creepy. He is far, far better than Kenneth. Claire nodded in agreement, that's true. Who is Kenneth? Cam asked, demanding the full story. Also, what happened to his mother? How could she abandon him like that? While the ladies were gossiping, Phil was trying hard to convince Haley about the dinner with Edward tomorrow. Just come down, say you're sorry, and tell him you've forgiven him. I won't force you to talk to him if you don't want to. Which is a waste because he's a really great guy, don't you think? Haley rolled her eyes as Phil kept talking. Even the phone couldn't distract her from Phil's consistent yammering. Fine. Haley said in defeat. If you're done, can you leave? Some of us want to study. Alex chimed in from her desk. She was studying before Phil walked in and had to stop as Phil's rapid-fire words distracted her. A-H-H I'm going. Phil said and stood up from Haley's bedside. Alex, you're going to like that guy. He's also smart. Maybe you guys can be friends after this. Phil added. Please. None of Haley's friends will be a smart one. Alex said sarcastically. Haley opened her mouth to tell her about Edward, but then she smiled mischievously and decided to watch how the whole thing would play out. I wonder how she will feel when the boy who confessed to her comes to dinner tomorrow. Haley thought. Edward POV. The day started as usual. I made some sandwiches for today's lunch after breakfast. The lawyers came to the school and picked up the songs from me. After confirming with Pepper, I signed a few documents and allowed Pepper to handle the copyright for the music. This was, of course, after the lawyers received my father's signature. As Kem expected, many videos about me singing had popped up on YouTube, and I basically became famous in school overnight. I am however, still a loner as I exude some aura that made other children feel uncomfortable with, I guess. Jason, the chubby potato kid was the only one who spoke to me, and shockingly, he knew how to play the drums. I invited him to my home for a jamming session after school. He will text me after he receives permission from his parents if he could come. Mrs. Henderson called me into her classroom before the day ended. Mr. Newgate, you're here, Mrs. Henderson said. She wore a yellow blouse and a black long skirt today, looking as pretty as ever. Hello Mrs. Henderson, if you want my signature, I haven't created one for my fans yet. I joked, that's nice. However, I call you here to talk about something else. Your dad called this morning to discuss the matter of you transferring to Wisconsin. Ah, that. What about it? I asked curiously. So, you already know about it. There is, however, unfortunate news for you. Without passing all of your exams, you won't be able to graduate middle school this year. I see. But I can graduate if I pass all right. Mrs. Henderson looked at me in contemplation. Yes. Despite your previous performance, you can graduate if you receive at least a C on every subject other than history. For history, you need to get at least a B. I advised you to get a tutor to help you with it as soon as possible. I could help arrange one for you if you want. I thought for a while, and decided to reject the offer. It's okay Mrs. Henderson. I can get A's in all subjects by myself. The teacher shook her head in pity. The door opened for the second time, and a glasses-wearing seventh grader walked in. Alex. You're here. Mrs. Henderson greeted her with a smile, unlike the way she greeted me, cold and emotionless. Hi Alex. I waved my hand at her. She scoffed and placed a thick stack of paper neatly on Mrs. Henderson's table. I'm sorry Alex, the extra credit for tutoring had to be rearranged. Mrs. Henderson said. Hmm. Alex turned to me and then the teacher. She breathes in relief inwardly, as she didn't think that Mrs. Henderson would pair her with me. Oh. I exclaimed in understanding. However, I didn't regret my decision. Okay then, see you tonight Alex. I said before I walked out of the classroom. Tonight. Both teacher and student there tilted their heads in confusion after hearing my words. I smirked as I walked away. After a jamming session and outfit creation, finally it's time for dinner. Chapter 10, Chapter 10, Dinner. Part 1. A slash N. I finished my book debut 10 chapter in 3 days haha. Next chapter will be on Monday, and I will try to post at least 5 chapter per week from now on. If you love the story, add it to your collection. See ya. Hello. Is anyone home? I shouted as I knocked on the door of Dunphy's house. 
Adorning a black t-shirt and black cotton pants, I completed my assembly with Converse shoes and a grey textured sweater. I heard some clattering from the inside, and took a step backward from the door as the sound grew nearer. Phil in a simple, green, and purple collared shirt opened the door and said, Edward, you're early. Hmm? You said to come by at five. I tilted my head in confusion. I arrived directly on time, neither late nor early. Why do you do that Phil? Dinner is at 7.30. Claire approached Phil from behind and asked in frustration. Her hair was tied up, and she wore a green dress with white pants. Well, I thought we could have some fun first before dinner. Phil answered guiltily. Claire stared at him with scary eyes and her arms crossed, causing him to avoid his wife's gaze. Welcome Edward. Claire said after pushing Phil out of the way. What's that? Claire asked when she saw the box in my hand. Well, as I'm still underage, I couldn't buy wine. That's true. And, don't. Claire interjected. I nodded slightly and continued, so I made dessert. But it needs to be placed in the chiller for another hour. Okay. Come on in Edward. Phil, show him the fridge. Claire smiled and ordered. Phil stopped avoiding the gaze as he watched his wife walk upstairs and smiled at me. So, what did you make, Eddie? Phil said as he tried to take the box from me. However, the content inside was delicate so I smoothly avoided his hand. I would like to put this in the freezer first, if I can. A little stunned, Phil replied, okay, it's in the back. He didn't mind my behavior, and just thought I was embarrassed by the gift. It's an Aria cheesecake. I replied to Phil, albeit a little late. Aria. Phil asked in confusion. Luke downstairs as he heard the commotion at the door. Hey Edward. Luke greeted cheerfully. Hey Luke. It was my first time walking inside the Dunphy's house, but the place was familiar. The white colored stair with black colored steps, the beige sofa with two multicolored cushions where they usually conducted their interviews, the pictures on the stairs, the fireplace, and then the kitchen. Nothing had changed from the house that I knew of. I set the cake inside the chiller and finally breathed in relief. Can I see it? Luke asked. Buddy, it isn't ready yet. Phil said. You can see it but promise me not to disturb it. It isn't ready yet. I said calmly, but warned them at the same time. I promise. Luke replied. I then turned to the smiling Phil. He was confused, but then he realized it. I promise to. Okay. I opened the box to let them see the cake. It's a circular shaped cake that looks like a giant aria. The bottom layer was a crushed Oreos biscuit added with melted butter. The middle part was a combination of cream cheese, the aria fillings and other stuff. The top part sieved blended aria cookies, just to make it look good. I decorated the top part with whipped cream and placed nine whole aria cookies in a circular pattern, alternating between the whipped cream. Phil asked excitedly, did you take off the aria's fillings and make a giant aria for dessert? What? No dash. Mom? Ed made a giant aria. Luke called his mom in excitement hurriedly. Alex heard the shout from her bedroom, and was curious about the situation. She put her pen down and closed her books. Luke? No. I panicked and my voice turned into a weird high-pitched voice. What was that? Phil asked while laughing. Puberty I think. I replied, checking my voice a few times to make sure it had gone back to normal. Oh. Phil was stunned and stopped laughing abruptly. He changed the topic quickly and asked, how many packs do you use to create this? Not many. Just two packs. Also, it's a cake, not a giant cookie. As I closed the refrigerator door, I walked to the end crashed with Alex who had just come downstairs. She widened her eyes as she didn't expect the boy who'd been bothering her for a few days was inside her house. Phil tried to grab me, but it was too late. Oh hell. I cursed as I was falling down with the girl. I grabbed the back of her head and hugged her tightly as I changed our position so that I would take the fall instead of her. I closed my eyes as I prepared myself. Bam. Ouch. My back slammed onto the floor, but I'd saved my head in the fall. I felt something soft brushing my lips while I'm falling, but as I closed my eyes, I didn't know what had happened. Are you okay? I asked Alex who's frozen still while on top of me. You you. Alex became flustered as she heard the question. Can you get off? I don't mind you staying on top of me, but we should wait until the third date dash. Alex. Claire ran toward the scene of the accident and removed Alex from being on top of the boy. Mom? Why is he here? Alex asked, her voice filled with a mixture of anger and embarrassment. Your dad invited him to dinner. What happened? Why are you both on the ground? Claire asked anxiously. Did you throw him? She asked accusingly. Claire. Alex didn't use judo throws on him. They crashed with one another as they didn't look where they were going. Phil clarified as he helped me get up from the floor. Are you okay Eddie? Yeah. I'm fine. This is nothing. I replied to Phil and then turned to Alex. Are you okay? I asked in concern as she had been quiet, which quite wasn't in line with her personality. I expected to be cursed at, but nothing happened. Alex covered her mouth with both her hands and ran off to her bedroom hurriedly. She's okay. Claire replied. Mom, you need to see this. Ed made a giant aria. Luke said, already had opened the fridge door I'd closed before. Hmm. Claire exclaimed and took a look at the giant cookie. She covered her mouth and turned her scary gaze at the creator. Edward, this is very unhealthy. Claire said with a pitiful voice. I rolled my eyes and picked up a spoon. I took a spoonful of the cake and pushed it into Claire's mouth. She tried to object, but my hand was too fast, Ed hmm. Claire tasted the dessert properly and licked the cream on her lips seductively. It's, good. 
And, it's cheesecake, she asked. Yeah, now, let it settle, it isn't finished yet, I said sternly. Claire nodded and closed the fridge door. Wait, I want to try, Luke said hurriedly, but I stood guard in front of the fridge door. What did your mom tell you about eating dessert before dinner? Claire and Phil were stunned, and Luke lowered his head. Not to he replied sadly. Good, you'll get the biggest piece later, I said as I rubbed his hair a few times. I know I'm adorable, but hands off the hair. He rolled his eyes and walked to the den where his show was on. Make sure to keep that promise, Luke shouted as he sat on the sofa. Do you need any help with preparing the food Mrs. Dunphy? I asked politely. Still in disbelief, Claire shook her head slightly and answered, and no, you can sit with Luke. Okay, if you need any help, just call, I said and went to sit next to Luke. The TV was showing the movie Ratatouille, a movie about a rat controlling a chef to cook inside his chef head. Oh it's been a while since I watched Pixar. I muttered as I relaxed myself on the sofa. The movie continued as I talked and joked with Luke. The movie was released in 2007, so we both had watched the movie before. Luke, if I pull your hair like the rat did, will it move? I asked teasingly. Luke widened his eyes as if he heard the most interesting things in the world. Do it. If this works, I no longer have to brush my teeth on my own. He said in excitement. I laughed and asked him to sit in front of me. Dash 3 RD person POV. Phil and Claire stood side by side as Claire took out the ingredients for the dinner. He's really mature. And polite. Phil complimented as he looked at Edward from afar. That's true. But can I know he's not just pretending? I mean, you heard his songs. Claire held a knife in her hand and started to cut the carrot. Maybe he just heard it from somewhere. I don't think he would do that, I think. Phil argued. Also, there was so much more to his songs than the alcohol part. Why can't you focus on that? Phil asked. He stared at the children longingly and wanted to join in the fun on the sofa. He then heard Edward's question about hair controlling the body. Phil, you're going to help me. We have to cook a bit faster now because you invited him so early. Phil, Phil. Phil heard the question and ran toward the sofa, leaving Claire alone in the kitchen. She stared at her husband in disbelief. Her knife-wielding hand was pointed forward at Phil. The doorbell rang, but only Claire heard it as Phil had joined Luke and Edward, laughing like mad as Luke pulled Phil's hair. His hand moved, making Edward open his mouth in awe. Hola Claire. In the front door, Gloria, Jay, and Manny had come to visit. Jay wore a horizontal pattern, black shirt, Gloria wore her blue dress and Manny was in his puffy shirt. Claire widened her eyes in confusion, but welcomed them inside anyway. What's going on? Claire asked. Gloria wants to ask about the soccer match on Sunday morning. Jay explained with a hint of sadness in his voice. He had to wake up early in the morning for the Sunday matches. He thought that after his own children's, he wouldn't have to anymore. You, couldn't call. Claire asked in disbelief. This is important. Manny interjected anxiously. My dad told me that football is easy, but I'd never played it before. He meant his Colombian father, not Jay, his stepdad. We're thinking. Luke teach Manny one or two things before his match, this Sunday. Gloria explained. Luke. Claire contorted her face as she couldn't believe her ears. Jay and Gloria's commentary. Manny is a bit worried about his first match in his new school. I thought playing with Luke could help him. Gloria explained. Tell them about the other thing. Jay said and pointed at the interviewer. Gloria looked at him and then at the interviewer with a complicated expression. Maybe, the kids getting along will make our families closer. It's been hard for me and Manny to get along with the rest of Jay's family. Commentary ends. Edward POV. Hmm. I turned to look at the door as I saw the newcomers coming in. It was Jay, Gloria, and Manny. Huh. I exclaimed flatly. Phil and Luke were still laughing together, unaware of the visitors. Luke. Manny's here to see you. Claire said flatly with a forced smile as she brought the visitors to the den. Gloria and Jay had only been married for six months at this time. Although Claire tried her best to make Gloria feel comfortable with their family, sometimes she couldn't help but feel a bit conscious when around Gloria, especially with Phil always acting like a perv with the Colombian beauty. You're new. Jay noticed the additional kid inside the room. Well, I am Phil's estranged son, that came to visit after not knowing who my dad was for 14 years. I replied seriously. You're what? Gloria asked in a loud voice. Boy, is she loud. Claire stopped what she was doing and turned her attention into the conversation. Even Phil was shocked by my statement and he started to think about all the girls he dated before. I'm just joking. I'm the neighbor's kid. I explained with a smile. I stood up and held my right hand for a handshake to the new family. My name's Edward. I live down the streets. I introduced myself politely. Jay Pritchett. I'm Luke's grandfather. Jay introduced himself curtly while shaking the hand I offered. Gloria Delgado Pritchett. Gloria said as I shook her hand. Manny Delgado. Manny introduced himself quickly. Pestania dos visas si esta siendo redinida en contra de tu voluntad. Blink twice if you're held against your will. I said with a calm smile as I looked at Gloria. K. Okay. Gloria was a bit stunned, and then she laughed out loud. No, este es mi esposo. No, this is my husband, she explained and hugged Jay's hand to show that everything's fine. En serio, puedes elegir a cualquier chico del mundo y lo eliges a él. Seriously, you can pick any guy in the world and you choose him. I asked jokingly. 
No lo paris, pero el chin mucho dinero, he didn't seem much, but he has a lot of money. Gloria gestured money with her finger stealthily. I chuckled while Gloria laughed again. We both know that we're just joking. Manny chuckled too as he knew what Gloria and I talked about. From the kitchen, Claire muttered silently, he's fluent in Spanish too. What's going on? Jay asked in confusion. I know what dinero means. That means money. Jay demanded to know angrily. Nothing. He just said I look very nice. The dress must cost a lot of money. That's it. Gloria covered up quickly to Jay. Your Spanish is very good. She complimented, skillfully changing the subject. Even better than Manny's. Manny looked at his mother in shock. As Jay was becoming frustrated, I knew the perfect thing to ask to calm him down. I studied hard. Mr. Pritchett, any chance you're related to Danger O'Shea, the legendary daredevil? Jay broke into the heartiest smile and said, No, but I know that guy. I collected a few of his memorabilia. I will show it to you, you know, if you want. Of course. I am his fan. I said cheerfully. That was his persona before he fully committed to the closet business. I need to have a speech increased by 100 notification popping out now. I could feel my sweet talk level increasing. I thought secretly. After learning Gloria's purpose to visit, Luke went to his room to grab the ball. He and Manny ran outside to the backyard to play while Jay watched. I decided to join in and saw two kids messing around with the ball, not practicing in the least. Manny brought his own ball, so they were playing with one ball each kid. Do you guys even know how to kick a ball? I asked. I know. My dad taught me. Luke said. Same here. Manny replied. Jay turned to look at me, but he still didn't say anything. Throw me the ball. I said to Luke. He then threw the ball with all of his might, not caring whether I could catch it or not. But for an ex-European who called the game as its true name, I had years of experience in soccer. I trapped the ball with my chest, cancelling its momentum. It fell on the ground, and I stopped it from rolling away by stepping lightly on it with my right foot. Luke, the aim of the throw is to pass the ball to your team member, not to kill him. I joked. Jay snorted but he covered his mouth to not let the kids see him smile. He's afraid it would hurt their self-confidence or something. Let's do a simple passing practice. You'll run side by side, and you need to pass the ball to your team member as you run. Jay and Phil will show an example. Wait, what? Jay asked in confusion as his name suddenly called out. Yeah, they need an example. I can't do this by myself. I lied. It would be a good memory for Phil to play with Jay. I saw him peeking through the sliding door as he was captured by Claire to help him cook dinner tonight. Jay and Phil stood facing each other after Luke called Phil to help. Claire couldn't handle Luke's cuteness and released Phil from her grip. Use the side of your leg to kick for a pass, not with the front. I said as I teach them a few tips and tricks to get started. They knew how to run and play with the ball, but they never received any proper lesson for it. Lock your ankle for your kicking leg. The other leg should be pointed in the direction you want to pass the ball to. Okay, now pass. Fifteen minutes later. Can we stop doing this now? Jay said, already sweaty from the exercise. I used Jay and Phil to help the kid follow the example they showed. Okay, they got it now. I said as I pointed at the kids. They already showed massive improvement in their skills, and had been playing on their own for five minutes. I just let Phil and Jay continue playing on their own as Phil was loving it. Third party POV. In the kitchen. Gloria, why don't you and your family eat with us tonight? Claire said awkwardly while putting the chicken into the microwave. Really? Won't that be an, an inconvenience? Gloria said with broken English. She'd been growing up in Colombia, and English was her second language. She struggled to find the words sometimes, therefore she was feeling pretty great when she could talk to Edward in Spanish before. No, not at all. Also, what did Edward talk to you about before? Claire asked, trying to get the details. Nothing. We just talked about my dress. Gloria covered up for Edward again. Huh. Claire exclaimed, her eyes filled with suspicion. Alex peeked at the kitchen from the stairs, and found out that Edward was outside the house. She traced her lips, thinking about the incident before. Edward closed his eyes, but Alex's eyes were wide open. As they were falling, Alex's almost lip accidentally pressed against Ed's. That was my first kiss. That bastard. Alex growled angrily. She then shrugged and corrected herself, well not technically a kiss. But still, Haley walked into the house through the front door as she just got back from the mall. What are you doing crouching there you weirdo? Haley asked as she saw Alex. Nothing. When is your friend going to get here? Did dad invite him along with Newgate? Or is he? He is not my friend. But yeah, it's him. Haley said teasingly. Alex's face turned horrified and she ran off to her room again. Haley laughed as she saw her sister's misery. Oh, this is so fun. Haley exclaimed as she walked into the kitchen. After talking with her mom for a short period, she went upstairs to poke more fun at her sister. Will he confess his love here too? Haley teased. Shut up. He didn't confess to me. He only said I'm pretty. Alex replied. Haley was stunned for a second as she didn't think Edward would say something like that. Not when he was attracted by men instead of women. Maybe Alex's masculinity attracted him? I'm so confused right now. Haley thought to herself. Author's note. Join my Discord channel for more updates and gotcha recommendations. I will put the RECS into a lottery wheel before I rolled the next gotcha he will get and build the story based on the randomness of the gotcha. https colon slash slash discord dot gg slash cam d34bj. See you there.